Okay, good afternoon everybody. Thank you ever so much for joining us at our debate this afternoon. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of Professor Darrell O'Connor, our first speaker, who unfortunately has been delayed due to a uh, fatality on the train line, but he should be with us by three o'clock and we'll be speaking immediately after the, the tea break. Um, so we've got a slight change in the order of our um, event today. So we'll be starting off with, um, actually was intended to be our last speaker, Chris Graff from Wiley, and then we'll be proceeding through as planned as I say, apart from with Professor O'Connor speaking immediately after the tea break, and then the rest of the, the event will proceed as originally planned. Um, two things I would like to draw your attention to. Uh, the first is that we are looking for audience engagement in the event, and to facilitate this, we've set up a debate platform on Slido, which is available on www.slide.do. Um, and the event code is 7637. Um, what I'd like you all to do is if you do have an electronic device, a phone or a tablet, if you can take it out and log on to the event and then post any questions um, that you have that we'll then use to inform the debate at the end of the sessions, that would be fantastic. And I think, Andy, you've also set up um, a poll on Slido that also you'd like the audience to, to complete before, pr presumably before your talk, so um, that would be great. Um, the other is, if you are using social media, if you can use the hashtag psychdebate2, that would be fantastic. And I hope you enjoy the event this afternoon and the wine reception afterwards. Thank you very much. Chris, if you'd like to kick off for us. Hello. Thanks for having me. It's really nice to be here. Um, it's a bit daunting to move from the end of the programme to the very start. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, well, I'm, you know, I'm happy to be doing it, though. Um, my name's Chris Graff. I'm a long-time publisher. I, I, I left Sheffield University with a degree in chemistry, knowing that blowing up the lab one too many times meant that I should do absolutely anything else, um, and started working in publishing pretty much 20 years ago, um, and since then, well, it kind of stuck, and that's nice. Um, so now I work at a company called Wiley, which um, BPS um, contracts to publish the BPS journals, and we're very happy about that. I guess that is why I'm here. My job at Wiley is, well, was until May last year, kind of my hobby. I, it says here, uh, Chris Graff volunteers for COPE, the Committee on Publication Ethics. I'm the co-chair of COPE which is a, uh, a charity and a membership organisation that promotes integrity in research and its publication. And until um, kind of May last year, that was a, a kind of hobby for me at Wiley. Um, but in May, it became my full-time job at Wiley. So now I am the director for research integrity and publishing ethics at Wiley, which is kind of great when your hobby becomes your job, right? Um, that's me. Uh, this is what I'm going to share with you today. Three things that publishers can do to help support integrity in research and, it's, and, it's, and the way it's published. And I'll tell you a bit about, uh, well, it's kind of obvious, right? The three things are to listen to everybody who we serve, the communities for whom we publish, and actually not just listen, but understand what those communities are telling us. And then to react to that, so to support actively um, the things that those communities need for us to do to deliver the kinds of quality of service but also quality of research publishing that we deliver for those communities. And last of all, I'm going to suggest that at the heart of um, being a research publisher is collaboration. Research publishers probably would be wise to remember that publishing research is not doing research. Publishing research is an important part of the things that you do when you do research, part of the communication of research but there's a lot more to it. And that means that we must always collaborate. So let's take those three fairly um, abstract, perhaps anodyne things and try and make them real for you. Start by listening and understanding. We're gonna talk about zombie apocalypse. We're gonna talk about cutting each other some slack. And we're gonna talk about making things simple uh, for authors. The first of those is from a a gentleman called John Schmidt. 
who apparently is a voice for the voiceless in the replication crisis. All right, and on his uh, blog, which there is the link if you'd like to read it, you can, he suggests that total vaporisation of the earth by an exploding sun would solve the replication crisis, and then goes to suggest that other things like zombies, deep impact demons, and just ignoring this thing called the replication crisis would also be a solution. Well, thank you very much, John. That's not very helpful. Really, I, not very helpful. Perhaps what it does tell us is that it's a complicated thing, this thing called the replication crisis, and that there isn't going to be any one simple, single solution. That's about the only thing that's useful about what John has shared there, I think. Oh, and the picture. <laughs> that's the Crab Nebula from the uh, 1054 supernova, and it's from the Hubble spacecraft. Kind of cool, hey? So that's John Schmidt. Next up is Jeff Leek, if we're listening to people. Jeff Leek has a uh, blog called Simply Statistics, and he says lots of sensible things on that blog. One of his posts from probably two months ago was eight things that we could do to reduce the stress around reproducibility. And the eighth of those things is to cut each other some slack. Okay, it's quite stressful. Um, he's, there's seven other things I could read out for you. I will. Um, we need to define what we mean by uh, reproduce and what we mean by replicate. There are various definitions out there, but I bet we all get confused with them. I, I do. Uh, we need to remember that replication is statistical um, and not deterministic. And I think what that means is that, you know, if you're doing an experiment and your result is determined by probability, then it's, yeah, guess what? It's determined by probability and statistics. And uh, a different um, experiment uh, also determining its results by probability may disagree with you. And he, he goes through a number of other things as well, which are quite, um, quite useful and quite calm, actually, and a mature view of what we're doing here. So I like Jeff Leake. Good on you, Jeff. You're not here, are you? No? Okay. The third person who is listening and telling publishers things that are useful <coughs> is Sally Romsey. Sally uh, leads open access and data publishing at Oxford's Bodleian Libraries. Mm, there she is. She visited us at Wiley a couple of weeks ago and gave us her wish list of things that would make uh, research communication better. Um, her slides are available at that link, and also her answers to three questions uh, are available at that link. But the, one of the things, one of the take-homes is, is that everything is too hard for researchers. Right, obeying, obeying, complying with um, funder mandates and you know, co copyright mandates and, and now thinking about open research and how to publish or make your data available and how to you know, uh, cite, cite it when, when, when you want to cite it. This is all pretty complex and um, something that we could all do to help would be to try and make that as simple as possible for everybody involved. So that's some listening, right? It's no good listening if you don't then go and act upon what you've learned. So I'm suggesting that publishers need to both listen and understand and then act. Ooh. Act upon what they've learned. And what I think the ways that uh, publishers should act should be built around supporting quality um, and supporting the things that communities like the psychology community, but like all of those for whom we publish, um, supporting what those communities actually want and need. So let's think about that a bit. When I got my new job at Wiley, I asked everybody at Wiley what, what was top of their mind. Top of their mind as an integrity issue. And 37 good colleagues replied out of about a couple of thousand. You know, that's all right by me. But they said, uh, when I read, and maybe those of you who are researchers do this a lot, but when I read those uh, 37 responses, I categorised the information that they shared with me and sort of put it into different catch-alls, which, you know, there's no hierarchy, there's no science to those catch-alls, but whenever anyone mentioned reproducibility, I counted that as a one. And whenever anyone mentioned data publication, I counted that as a one. And these are the top five, all right? Image manipulation, authorship and credit, plagiarism, reproducibility, and data publication. And clearly, we're here to think about reproducibility today. But I thought it might be handy if I showed you some of the things that other disciplines are concerned with. Right? So we're going to flip over to the other end of the picture and look at image manipulation. 
So it's time for some audience participation. Woo! Who knows what that is? Who wants to shout out what that is? Be brave. Western blot. Western blot, yes. OK, then. Um, Western blots are data, right? People think about data often as being numbers in a spreadsheet or in a, uh, some other R package, right? Is R a, no, it's not a data housing place, is it? It's a software that crunches data. Anyway, people think about data as numbers often, but these images are actually data. And there is a temptation to make them look prettier because journals want things are pretty, that are pretty, right, to publish because they're illustrations. No, these are data. There is also a temptation to mm, make stuff up because you can uh, with numbers, but you can also with pictures as well. So if you look um, more carefully at this image, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a, you know, an artifact in the image, a straight line there. Can you see that? And what has happened is the researcher has copied and pasted the image, right? So that's data fabrication. That's research fraud, right? Uh, it's in the control line, not the results line or the experimental line. So perhaps that's not so bad. And perhaps the blots are present beneath those pasted blots. And the thing that the researcher was doing was, you know, making it look nicer because the blots weren't very intense. Or perhaps they weren't there at all. I, I don't know. You can't tell. But you can tell it's been manipulated. So these are um, some of the things that we're dealing with, or an example of the kinds of things that we're dealing with outside of psychology that may or may not um, be part of your world, probably aren't part of your world. And it's a data problem, right? That image is data. Here's another data problem. My good colleagues in uh, the Weinheim part of Wiley that does um, some of the world's best chemistry publishing tell me that half of... Um, all the carbon-13 NMR data that are published, you know, contain errors. Right? They might be sort of transcription errors where the readout from a spectrometer has been typed incorrectly into a, uh, an interpretation program. Um, and they, or they might be, uh, you know, something else. Right? But either way, the data do not match what the actual structure that the spectros spectroscopy is indicating is present. The, the structure is wrong, okay? So maybe we can do things with images and maybe we can do things with carbon-13 NMR to sort of validate data in new ways. And that will be actively listening and responding to the things that we're hearing from the community. So here's a solution. This is not an ad, okay? This is not a service that people can buy, it's a service that people can use for free. It's something that Wiley has where you plug in to that website, the, um, the readout from your spectrometry and the proposed structure, and then with clever, um, oh, it's not really AI, with a whole bunch of algorithms, um, the software tells you whether your proposed structure uh, matches what the world of chemistry tells you it ought to be. I mean, that's pretty good. That's validating um, NMR data. It also gives you, as a researcher, a certificate that you can include in your submission package to say, my data are good per this piece of software. So please, editor, look, look, look favorably upon my data. Pretty cool, right? Maybe data validation uh, is something that we could improve to help with the whole replication thing. What about methods? Who's heard of registered reports? Probably about half of you. OK. So outside are a couple of posters. They look a bit like this. That's good, isn't it? Because it's tiny. But you, you know, you, it looks a bit like that. Um, and uh, go and check them out. So um, this is uh, Daryl, who should be here, um, talking about an innovation at the Journal of Neuropsychology, edited by Martin Edwards. Is Martin here? No. Um, in December, uh, Martin and Daryl launched registered reports at the Journal of Neuropsychology. And registered reports are a way to uh, test the methods and validate the methods for a researcher prior to that researcher embarking upon you know, the actual experiment. So the journal will review your methods, give you feedback, and if you address the, um, the feedback properly, the peer review feedback properly, uh, and then go and conduct the experiment, they will give you an in-principle acceptance. So no matter what your results, they will publish your work because the methods are sound. 
So you can find out more about that um, at the booth out there. So there you go. I've talked about listening to what's going on out there and, and talked about responding to the things that um, we can do at Publishers to help. I, the last thing that I suggest, said that I would talk about was, well, was collaborating. So um, I, I, I think I said that publishing research isn't doing research and that publishers should remember that. Actually, everybody should remember that. I think we're all a little bit fixated on, on getting a paper out, right? Um, and that's all great, but really it's not doing the research, is it? And so publishers need to remember that uh, in particular because we're part of a whole process. And that means that collaborating with those involved with the research process is super important. In fact, essential at all times. It's important to remember that we don't call the shots, but it does make it important for us to try and lead change in positive directions as well. And I'm going to give you um, the next slide, which is a, an example of collaboration, but it's also some, an invitation to you all to get involved with something that's going on right now and to join that collaboration. So um, who's heard of the Centre for Open Science? Like again, about half of you, terrific, look them up. Um, maybe uh, two years ago, 2015, three years ago, um, chaired by the Centre for Open Science, a set of guidelines called the TOP guidelines, Transparency, Openness and Promotion. It's quite a clumsy acronym, but anyway, the TOP guidelines were published in a, a famous journal called Science um, under a wrapper called Promoting Open Research Culture with Brian Nosek as the first author who I think spoke here the last time this event happened. And um, they're great, right? Uh, thousands of um, journals and publishers and people and organisations have signed up to endorse the top guidelines, um, which lay out ways to be transparent, um, eight standards and three levels of transparency. I mean, they're kind of great, right? Loads of people signed up, but then it was hard for anybody to actually use them. All right, so implementing the top guidelines is a challenge. Um, a group of us, including um, researchers, including fund research funders, including representatives from research institution, including institutions, um, including um, publishers, and other uh, people that you would label stakeholders, um, arrived in Charlottesville back in September at the Centre for Open Science. And our mission was to work out how to implement top the top guidelines so that people didn't just sign up to them so that they were actually able to use them and make their data available more easily, make their methods more clearly described and available more easily and in longer form than perhaps a journal article might be able to do that and, and so on. And here they are. Well, I'm not going to show you them now. Here they are in a link, right? A draft um, version of top part two, um, which is all about implementing top part one. It's not a new version of top, it's how to implement top. And if you'd like, it's there in a Google Doc for you to go and have a look at and have comment upon. So please do that. That's an example of publishers joining in collaborations. It's also, like I said, an invitation to everybody here to, to collaborate as well. And I'll leave you with a quote from one of my favourite people, Ginny Barber. Um, Ginny was the chair of COPE before I became the co-chair of COPE. Here she is. Um, she used to work at the Public Library of Science, and now she's in Australia doing other open access things. And at a COPE seminar in Tokyo maybe uh, three years ago, she said, we need a culture of responsibility for the integrity of the literature. Um, it's not just the job of editors. And my take on that is it's not just the job of any one of us or any one group of us. It's something that we all need to be pretty obsessed with and to do what we're doing here today, working out ways to make the um, research literature exhibit perhaps more integrity. And that's where I'll leave you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, I should say um, two things I forgot in introducing the event and for which I can only 
blame on my nervousness, so apologies for that. Firstly, to introduce myself, I'm Dr Lisa Morrison Coulthard and I'm the Society's Lead Policy Advisor um, and I work with Professor Darrell O'Connor on the Society's Research Board, um, which was the board that, that has kind of pulled this event together. The second most important thing I should have said was um, in terms of Wi-Fi access. Um, which is obviously critical if you want to use Twitter or indeed use the Slido platform. Um, so if you haven't already located it, it's um, the RS network is the um, main Wi-Fi network and the passcode is Newton with a capital N plus, as in the plus sign, Apple. Um, so hopefully you'll, you'll be able to join us on the Slido platform. Um, the other thing about Slido to explain is that it works a little bit like Facebook, if for those of you that are familiar with it, in that there's a little um, sort of thumbs up next to people's questions. So if you like the question, if you agree with it, and also if you think it's a particularly important one that you would like to ask the panel, then please do click on that. And because it's the questions with the highest number of likes that we'll be asking first when we get to the panel debate later. So my apologies for missing out all of that critical information earlier. So moving on, I'd like to introduce Andy Field, who will be talking to us about whether researchers should analyse their own data. I thought it was a picture of me for a minute. <laughs> Obviously not. Right. Okay, just a little heads up. The answer is no. <laughs> now, to uh, help me convince you of this fact, uh, I want to introduce you to uh, a researcher who is going to help me to illustrate some points. Coincidentally, his name is Andy too. So you can read into that what you will. I'm going to let him introduce himself. Is your name Andy? I don't know how to answer that. Simple yes or no. Well, everyone calls me Andy, but my full name is Andrew, I think. So, no? Wait. Yes. <laughs> so what I'm going to talk about are three things that can influence whether results are true. There are other things, but these are the things that I'm going to talk about. The first uh, are researcher degrees of freedom. The second is objectivity. And the third is competence. So starting off, first of all, with researcher degrees of freedom. And again, it's back to Andy. I'm going to say that there is at least... a chance that I didn't think this through completely. So research of degrees of freedom uh, comes into play really in terms of thinking ahead about what you're doing. So all research that you do, there are research of degrees of freedom and that is just a fact of life. So for example, there was a study a couple of years ago where 29 teams of data analysts were given the same data and the same hypothesis to test and they came up with a wide variety of different ways to test it. So at the beginning of your research process, there will be lots of degrees of freedom in what you do. What outcome measures do you use? In my former life uh, researching child anxiety, if I want to do a study on child anxiety, there's about 15 different questionnaires I could use. I could use physiological measures. I could use behavioral tasks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We have degrees of freedom when we're designing research studies. But I'm going to talk about where these degrees of freedom can become problematic. One of them is questionable research practices. And I've kind of split these two things because I, I, I sort of think, or the way I've lumped them together is really sort of deliberate attempts to manipulate your results versus what I've rather patronizingly called they know not what they do errors, <laughs> which I'm going to cover in the competence section. So assuming that you're going to test the hypothesis that you're interested in with null hypothesis significance testing, this is the framework that you're using, which I'm, I'm going to assume everyone's pretty familiar with it and not really go through it. Now, there are degrees of freedom that you're going to have right at the beginning. You're going to have degrees of freedom over what hypothesis you want to test, what predictions you want to make. You're going to have degrees of freedom over specifying the unique alpha that is appropriate for your research question. Although, of course, no one actually bothers doing that. They just pick 0.05 because that's what everyone else does. 
But theoretically, you have some degrees of freedom to pick an idiosyncratic alpha level, uh, which is going to feed into the sample size that you need to collect. And of course, you're going to have degrees of freedom over the model that you're going to pick to test the hypothesis of interest. And in particular, depending on what model you pick, that is going to affect what sampling distribution that model relies on to uh, test the hypothesis. That's kind of all fine. You know, it, like I said, it's a fact of life. There are degrees of freedom up here. Where degrees of freedom become problematic is after you start collecting data. So essentially, up here, not too bad. If you start operationalizing degrees of freedom over what you do uh, beyond this point, then your results are pretty much going to go to hell. Now, why are they going to go to hell? Well, it's to do with the fact that your p-value is a long-run probability. So it basically relies on the fact that you are setting up a study and you are computing a probability based on repeating that study kind of you know, an infinite number of times in an identical way. So if you start kind of messing around with things after you've started collecting data, then the p-value that comes out of SPSS or R or whatever you want to uh, choose to analyze your data is not going to reflect your original set of decisions. A very simple way to illustrate this is if you imagine a parallel universe that is identical in every single respect, where you are doing a piece of research, everything is identical. So you've, you've set up your uh, original study, you've set up uh, everything about it in exactly the same way, you've done your power analysis and realized that you need, say, 100 participants. You start collecting data. In one of your parallel universes, you collect 100 participants. In the other parallel universe, for some reason, you decide, oh, I'll just collect 90. I can't really be bothered with the last 10. Now, you'll get different p-values in those two parallel universes. One of your p-values is encoding information, not just about your hypothesis. It also has been contaminated by the decision you made to stop collecting data earlier. So the fact those p-values differ is because one of them has this has kind of been contaminated by what you have done, the decisions you've made. And you don't want your p-values contaminated by things that you have done. Because you, know, you want to know about your hypothesis. You don't want to know about things that you've done. So first of all, questionable research practices. So these are things that are kind of maybe deliberate attempts to manipulate your data. So there was uh, a meta-analysis uh, published in PLOS, I think it was, a few years ago, which reviewed several papers that had asked scientists whether they engaged in particular kinds of questionable research practices. And they had to respond for themselves, which, as you might imagine, probably uh, maybe underestimates things a little. Uh, and they also had to uh, respond based on whether they had experience of other people doing these things, where you might expect people to be a bit more free uh, about admitting to this sort of thing. So what I've done is uh, actually, uh, this table is like the highest percentages reported. So this was uh, assimilating information from lots of studies. These are the highest percentages reported. So it's like the most extreme scenario. So in terms of actually just making up data, uh, about 4.5% of scientists admitted to doing that themselves, and about 60% admitted to knowing someone who had done that. In terms of selective reporting or dropping cases to benefit your analysis, Again, rates within individuals admitting it for themselves, it's like, you know, 15%-ish. Uh, but if you look at other people, again, for like selective reporting, it's unbelievably high. Uh, fitting multiple models and reporting the most favourable. So this again, this will be a researcher degree of freedom that's put into practice after the data are collected. About 45% said that they knew someone who had done it. Uh, terminating the study at some other time than when you plan to terminate it. So that's like the parallel universe example. About a third of people admitted to doing that themselves. And using inappropriate designs, and in this respect, this would be designs that kind of maximise your chance of demonstrating the thing that you want to demonstrate. Uh, again, about sort of 13-ish percent uh, admitted to doing it, and uh, about 40% said they knew someone who'd done it. So there's a lot of, you know, potentially there's a lot of this kind of stuff going on. And yeah, that's bad enough, but I, I kind of, I think it's maybe not quite so bad as the other things, which are like non-deliberate things which will also have uh, negative impacts. Go ahead and sting me, please. It does nothing. So, p-hacking. Now, p-hacking, I sort of think, is a, in a way, is a middle ground between deliberate, act, you know, nefarious activities and maybe non-deliberate nefarious activities. Um, because, like, in a sense... I, I sort of think people maybe do this without realising that it's a bad thing. I mean, there, there have been some 
cases recently of people more or less publicly admitting to p-hacking and then sort of being surprised when people go, you do know you're p-hacking, right? And that's a bad thing. And then, mm, okay, uh, didn't realize that was a bad thing. But I also think it, there's probably, you know, it deliberately, people deliberately p-hack. So what is p-hacking? It's basically taking your data and testing it to death to try and find something in there to report and then creating some, you know, potentially creating some backstory as to why that's an interesting finding. Now, uh, this curve here is an example. There have been a few papers that do so-called P-curve analyses. There are, these analyses are problematic in various ways, but this is useful for just illustrating the point of what P-hacking might look like, although some people think it doesn't look like this at all. Um, the blue line represents the distribution of P-values you would expect to find, theoretically, and the orange dots represent the uh, distribution of P-values that you do find if, uh, I think this was... Uh, this was published in QJEP. I can't remember what journals it was uh, surveying, but I have a feeling it was uh, kind of Journal of Experimental Psychology type stuff. Anyway, so you can see the, the orange dots follow the theoretical distribution quite nicely, apart from at the critical value of 0.05, where suddenly there is a disproportionately high number of p-values at just below that threshold, almost as if people had been doing things to nudge their p-values below 0.05 to increase their chance of getting published. Like I said, though, there are, there are problems with this kind of analysis, but it just illustrates kind of what we mean. We're talking about people just doing lots and lots of studies until they find something cre creeping over the threshold of significance that they can publish. This might also, of course, reflect people deliberately manipulating uh, aspects of their analysis until their P sort of goes down. A related idea is uh, the idea of forking parts. In fact, um, it, if you read around... Forking paths and p-value, uh, p-hacking are quite often used interchangeably, uh, but I think there are subtle differences. So uh, the idea of forking paths is really about your data affecting how you analyse it. So there's two potential examples here. One is uh, you've made a prediction about something happening, and then uh, that prediction you know, doesn't seem to be supported by your data, but you're looking kind of at the means or whatever, or just looking at some sort of descriptive statistics, and you think, oh, well, hang on. When I, when I look at the men, the thing that I predicted seems to be happening, but in the women it doesn't. That's interesting, isn't it? And theoretically, that could also be interesting, because although I hadn't thought about it before, it does make sense that maybe I'd get this effect, you know, in one sex but not the other. And so then you analyse it. So what you're doing there is you're doing effectively a post hoc analysis, but you're not controlling for the fact you're doing a post hoc analysis. So that's one example. Another example is the decisions you make having seen your data about the model you fit. So, oh, I've got some outliers. Do I trim them? Do I transform the data? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you haven't planned for that ahead of time, again, your p-value is reflecting the decisions that were made after the data were collected. And that's not what you want. So it's a bit like doing this. Because we're smart. <laughs> God, are you okay? Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> Out of the way! Yeah! Woo! 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 Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh, I called the ambulance. A different ambulance, the one I ran into. That's a kamikaze! <laughs> so you look around your data until one of the analyses makes you happy. Now, of course, you can avoid all of this if you uh, refer to good, high-quality statistics texts, like this one. <laughs> but also, I believe that a lot of these things would be helped by having independent analysts. So I've listed some of the things I've just talked about there and whether I think an independent analyst would help. Fabricating data, I mean, clearly. Selective reporting, I think they have a limited influence on, potentially, because I guess... But I don't know, if they're authored on the paper they presumably do have an influence because they could just say, well, you know, I don't want to be authored on this because you're, you know, you're selectively reporting what we did. Uh, obviously, if they're not authors on the paper, that becomes more tricky, but they probably should be authors on the paper if they're analysing the data. Um, things like dropping cases, terminating the study early, a lot of this, assuming the analyst is involved in the design uh, and all the decisions before the data is collected, then they are potentially you know, a policing force over other things. So I think at the very least, they would make changes transparent. 
Now, a lot of the reason for this is because they can be objective. So I have an anecdote here to uh, illustrate what I mean. And I want to make clear that this anecdote is not directed at the person who is involved in the anecdote. It is uh, intended as an illustration of the pressures that scientists are under and the kind of incentive structures that we have that you know, kind of promotes this kind of uh, Look, behavior. I found all three differences. Those are two completely different pictures. So can people be objective about their own data? Now, uh, being someone who writes statistics textbooks, I get emails from random people, quite a lot of them, in fact. And this is an example of one such email. So it's the story of Dr. X. So X wrote to me and said, some people have failed to replicate my studies. I think their analysis is flawed. Can you help? Would you be willing to say something public about this whole situation? This would be tremendously helpful. And I thought, well, probably not until I've had a look at the data. So I said, bearing in mind I had a lot of other stuff to do, uh, if you send me your data and their data, I'll give you my objective opinion. I thought that was quite a nice thing to do. Anyway, what my objective opinion turned out to be was, uh, this is from my email back, my view is, I'm sorry to say, that the between-group effects are probably not real and the replicators are probably entirely justified in their conclusions. You certainly can't argue anything based on them applying an incorrect analysis. If they had, they would have reached the same conclusion only more strongly. That's just my opinion, right? And, you know, it's not like I was going to go out on Twitter and say this or anything. This was a private discussion between us. Um, but the response of X was this. Whilst it's true that my original study one was weak, there are two successful direct replications by independent researchers, and my collaborators and I have done a number of other successful studies. Like I give a shit. <laughs> so a rough translation of this is, although I respect your opinion enough to email you, unsolicited to comment on my data, I basically don't care what you think because it's not what I wanted to hear. P.S. I feel a strong need to convince you that I'm right. <laughs> now... I realise I'm, you know, I'm deliberately being very flippant about this, but the point I wanted to illustrate is people are under enormous pressure. We're all very personally invested in the research that we've done. It's a completely human response to respond in this way because you know, it's, it's very uh, threatening to have people comment on your work, or it can be very threatening. And that's because the incentive structures in academia are essentially all wrong. Does an independent analyst help with this? Yes because I think they can be objective. As this scenario shows, I wasn't the one who collected all of those data. I hadn't spent lots of time doing it. I hadn't invested emotionally in it. It was incredibly easy for me to draw that conclusion because I had no personal attachment to what that conclusion was. So finally, competence. I have no idea what I'm doing, but I know I'm doing it really, really well. <laughs> so do psychologists know what they're doing? Uh, so I want to use some, actually most of, the, most of these studies that I'm going to talk about I, are not particularly fabulous studies. They're just, again, illustrative. So um, actually many years ago there was a study by Oakes and what he did was um, he presented some uh, academic psychologists with six statements about what the p-value represented. And all of those statements were wrong. But he was interested in how many people would endorse any one of them as being true. So they could endorse none of them or one or more. It, it, you know, so it wasn't... You know, it wasn't like a multiple choice, it was just, you know, which ones of these are true. And he found about 97% would endorse at least one incorrect statement. So this was repeated more recently, uh, but the sample was split into methods and structures, uh, research active psychologists who didn't teach methods, and psych students. 100% of the psych students had at least one misconception about the p-value which is not remotely surprising, because these poor souls are being taught by these people, <laughs> and 80% of them had misconceptions about the p-value. And uh, the, uh, the psychs not teaching methods, uh, it was about 90% of them. What about confidence intervals? Uh, this was a study in psych methods a while back. So uh, basically, it was an online study. People were presented with this image of a confidence interval, and this confidence interval they could drag up and down, so it was like a, an online applet. And they were asked to drag this confidence interval to the point where its overlap with the other confidence interval represented a p-value of 0.05. Now, this diagram shows the correct position, so this is what people should have, well, where they should have dragged it to, and the dotted lines are sort of uh, what, they, what the authors considered a reasonable margin of error around that. Now, uh, in terms of who Either. So if we assume anything outside of these dotted lines is kind of wrong, if you like, and anything within dotted lines is broadly correct, um, I'm going to make this easy for you. The reds are the people who got it wrong. So the vast majority... Oh, sorry, this is psychologists, behavioural neuroscientists and medics. So the vast majority of people couldn't do this task 
particularly well. So again, illustrates that research active scientists in these disciplines are not particularly aware of what the relationship between, say, a confidence interval and a p-value is. What about, say, assumption testing? Now, broadly speaking, I'm, I'm picking this in particular because there's a bit of research sort of attached to it. So uh, if we look at the linear model and if we look at um, you know, the, the situation where essentially we're assuming a normal sampling distribution, p-values and confidence intervals will depend upon that sampling distribution being normal. Now, Will, Rand Wilcoxon's, uh, Wilcox, I always do that, Rand Wilcox in the States has done a load of research showing that when uh, distributions have heavy tails, so this means there's slightly too many scores in the sort of extreme ends of the tail of the distribution, basically it creates problems for power. And uh, in experiments where you've got multiple groups, if those groups are unequal, how it affects power is very, very unpredictable. He's also shown that although theoretically we'd expect sampling distributions to be normal in samples bigger than 30, Actually, with these heavy tail distributions, our samples might need to be much bigger before we can just assume that the central limit theorem kicks in. If you look at what psychology data looks like, uh, about two-thirds of it has heavy tails, at least in this study, which, again, I know is a little bit old. If you look at things like heteroscedasticity, again, biases confidence intervals, but that's not a problem particularly because there are ways to estimate standard errors around parameters in models that compensate for degrees of heteroscedasticity. So, you know, it's, it's not particularly a problem, but you need to adjust for it. So do people adjust for these things? Uh, again, this is not a particularly great piece of science or anything, but they, uh, look, they gave 30 researchers six data sets that, you know, um, and basically just kind of coded the process they went through to analyze them. And essentially, uh, only 12% of that sample correctly looked at normality. Uh, I mean, a, a few others had a go, but got it wrong. Um, and only about 22% correctly uh, checked out heteroscedasticity. And a couple of other studies by Osborne, uh, just looking at whether pub, uh, you know, research in published journals reports looking at assumptions of the models that are being fitted. Uh, in educational psychology journals, it's about 8.3%. Now, it doesn't mean they're not doing it, but they're certainly not reporting it, and that is kind of important information. Uh, and again, in APA journals, it's a fairly low number who are reporting checking distributional assumptions. Now, why might this be? Well, a thing that a lot of people say to me when they're uh, analysing data or asking me about this thing is, yeah, but ANOVA's robust. So is it robust? Well, there are people in the world many of them, who know a lot more about statistics than I, and I sought one of them out, the baby of statistics, who lives in the woods near my house, <laughs> under a tree. So I went out there one day, using a little map, and I found them, and I burrowed away in the roots of the tree until I found a little door. And I went through the little door, and within the little door was a little wooden cave, and in the corner of the cave was the baby of statistics, notoriously grumpy. But I managed to film our interaction. ANOVA is robust. <laughs> but it's OK, because there are lots of robust methods that we can apply. So again, the question is, do psychologists apply them? Well, uh, this is a very crude bit of data scraping that I did from Scopus. So it's over a million psychology articles. And this was just looking in the abstracts for whether they use phrases like trimmed mean bootstrap whether they cited Wilcox's book uh, and for terms like robust regression and robust anno. So bearing in mind, I reckon about 70% of psychology data probably <laughs> ought to require a robust model to be uh, fitted to it. So we'd expect you know, these to sum to something like sort of 70%. You can see actually, again, this is going to way, way, way underestimate, but very crudely, the, the numbers are minuscule. People are just not applying these robust methods anywhere near as much as they should be. The final thing I want to say is, um, given that we're at a BPS event, is as BPS members and psychologists, we are bound by the code of conduct. And there's a few things in the code of conduct that are particularly interesting. First is we should practice within the boundaries of our competence. Now, I don't know about you, but I regularly am faced with data uh, challenges where I feel I might be at the boundaries of my confidence. And I'm someone who probably takes more of an interest in statistics than a lot of uh, people. We are also supposed to seek consultation and supervision in situations where we feel beyond our uh, expertise, which, you know, well, 
as Richard, who's talking later, will tell you, I have bugged him quite a lot about Bayesian stuff over the last few years, um, but that's something we should be doing. And in my experience, every methodologist I've ever emailed with some idiotic question, uh, they've always been incredibly nice to me and given me lots of their time to explain things. Uh, and we should remain aware and acknowledge the limits of the methods that we use. So, will an independent analyst help with any of this? Again, just summarising everything we've been through, yes, I think they do. They help with all these researcher degrees of freedom, they help with objectivity, and self-evidently they help with competence because it's completely unrealistic to expect someone who's uh, you know, an expert in a field of psychology to also be a world expert in statistics, with the exception of Richard and EJ, obviously. Um, or, if you don't have <laughs> someone to consult, you can buy an excellent book. Okay, what I haven't said is anything about how we might implement that, but I'm hoping there might be some questions that we can talk about during the discussion around that. Uh, otherwise, thank you very, very much for your attention and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Andy. Um, it's now my very great pleasure to introduce Professor Susan Fisk. Well, I feel honoured, very honoured to be invited. Um, I'm not a statistical expert, um, but I have wandered into the domain of how we communicate with each other around methods during this crisis. So really you should take my remarks as being not about whether we will change our methods, but how we persuade each other to change the culture of data analysis and data reporting and, and so on. Um, so as I said, I wandered into this um, kind of naively, um, but having had some experiences with that, decided it was time to bring data to bear on the issue instead of just opinions. And I want to uh, point out that uh, these two students, um, Gandalf and Bai, um, are responsible for all the brilliant data analysis <laughs> that's in this paper. Um, so why am I focusing on methods blogs? Um, I, wanted, I want to... Uh, address their implicit goal, which is to uh, improve our methods and how we do that. I want to um, add some data to the historical record. I want to address some controversies, and I want to protect equity in the field. So these are my agendas. Let's talk about them. So who's not in favor of improving methods? I mean, really. Now I want bad methods. Um, but the question is how we do that, assuming that we want to use the best methods. We know as psychologists what works better uh, for lasting change is people internalizing the ideas that they learn, not just complying. Uh, that works better. Um, incentives work better than punishments. So if people do things in order to avoid pain, uh, that's not as good as if they're doing things in order to win uh, say recognition. Um, and then a third thing I want to address is that what I observe, and this is an informal observation, is that young people in the field in particular have gone into a phase of what Tori Higgins calls prevention focus. They're so worried about preventing mistakes that they're afraid to say anything. Um, and they've forgotten that part of science is also being willing to promote ideas and to, um, to gain rewards um, as well as prevent punishment. So what this is all boiling down to is advocating that we focus on persuading people rather than shaming them as methods for changing the culture of how we do science. So the question is, and this is a, a sort of a case study, is to what extent are we doing this? Um, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, I also want to add to the historical record. Uh, some of us in the room are old enough to remember other crises in the field. In the 1970s, 
this is going to really date me, when I was coming out of graduate school, there was a crisis in social psychology. There were symposia on the crisis in social psychology. Several of us wondered whether we should quit. Um, the criticisms were that there were all these flashy studies that only a few labs could replicate um, and that they weren't relevant to the real world. And so instead of people trying to replicate each other, what was happening um, was that people would say, you know, that effect that so-and-so gets that's so fascinating, I can't get it. Can you? No, I can't get it either. So it was kind of rumor mill instead of published failures to replicate, but that part of it was similar. There were changes that were made as a result of this kind of issue, um, and, but they were changes made by persuasion and example. So people began to worry more about effect sizes and power analysis. I can vouch, vouch for that because I was trained that way. Um, in a sort of biased way, I would argue that social cognition research helped because it had more rigorous models and measures. And then the relevance issue was um, addressed at the time by uh, more work on health psychology and other relevant areas, as well as some other things that Roger uh, could tell you about. Anyway, so what's happening this time, it seemed like it would be useful to address it more with data than with impressions or reminiscences or um, strong opinions. So um, the other issue, as I said, I backed into this um, with a lot of opinions, and the result was. <laughs> um, so how this happened was um, the president at the time of APS, Susan Golden Meadow, called me up and she said, have you heard the terrible things that are happening to people? People are being trashed and their careers are being destroyed and they're having mental health breakdowns. And I said, well, I've heard rumors about this. And she said, would you write about this? How dumb am I? I said, <laughs> I said sure, give me a service opportunity. You know, I'll do it. Um, well, um, so, so she asked me, uh, to talk about the impact that the new media are having on our science, but also on our scientists. That's how she framed it. And an early unedited version of this column was released, um, and there was uh, a firestorm of response. Not undeservedly, because I used some strong language, but um, it did get edited <laughs> in the final version, um, so then I felt better about it. Um, but here's what I was trying to say, that peer critiques are different in social media. The sheer volume and speed with which they happen, uh, the likelihood that they might be more personal and insulting, and that they can be more toxic and damaging to individual researchers. So um, I noticed that in a talk just before mine, there were examples given, but names were not named. And I've seen situations at conferences where somebody will be giving methods critiques, and they will talk about somebody in the audience, and the person in the audience had no way of knowing that they were about to be critiqued publicly. It's one thing if you're prepared for it. I mean, it's not pleasant, but you know, if you're prepared for it and you can have a response in real time, that would be better. Even more better would be forewarning about the content of the response so you could prepare a response. Anyway, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. I think that most methods critics are constructive, but on social media, these things are unvetted and unreviewed, except in a sort of post hoc crowdsourcing kind of way. And there's a really small uh, minority trend that is vicious and has a chilling effect on people. It silences people. And these are the personalized attacks. So this is what I wrote. It was based on stuff I was hearing. Um, and, on, and my aim was to advocate that science is a community built on trust, where we're all in it together, we're trying to improve science, but um, not destroy each other. So, um, you know, this was enough of a controversy that some people got up a petition, not supporting me in particular, but supporting a call for more open, critical, civil, and inclusive scientific discourse. And there were several hundred people who signed the petition. I'll say that the controversies are not over. About a month ago, there was a New York Times Magazine article about Amy Cuddy 
Um, and then uh, just earlier this week, there was an op-ed in the Boston Globe um, uh, naming several of the methods blogs in social psychology is written by a geneticist who was saying, call off the revolutionaries, treat each other in a better way, that's a better way to make progress. It's, it's quite a good op-ed, I think, in my opinion. But one of the issues, so, you know, this is not my day job <laughs> doing this. Um, normally what I do is study stereotyping and prejudice, in particular related to power structures. So, of course, I worry about equity issues. And one of the things that people were saying around casual gossip was, oh, there are a bunch of guys attacking vulnerable young women. Okay, that's really what the message was. Um, so uh, this is why I think it's important to address, you know, the information that we can get about who blogs what, about whom, and with what effect. Um, so there's sort of two points of view on what's, uh, what the methods blogs are trying to do. Um, the ideal is democratic and open and equitable. Anybody can have a blog. Anybody can comment on the methods blogs. That seems like a good thing. It's open science. It's crowdsourcing. In the ideal, it sounds good. Um, there's quality control because people can say, no, 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 you're wrong. Enough people say that, then the, meth the idea goes away. Um, but there is allegation of bias and collateral damage. Um, as I've said, there's some implied power dynamics going on regarding gender and also something else which I haven't mentioned, which is kind of crowd behavior, um, sort of like Lord of the Flies, if you've ever read that. Um, you know, people start to get beaten up and then everybody else is beating them up too. Um, there are, you know, this is not only sort of water cooler discussions. Uh, um, Tessa West and Linda Skidka and the SPSB Climate Committee had a survey where they asked people who use social media and um, what their use of it was and what the impact was, even if they don't, don't post things themselves or post comments. But um, people reported that watching other people get attacked made them want to disengage from the field. And that seemed pretty bad result to me. Um, so it was not just being attacked yourself, but watching other people be attacked. So this is what I'm talking about, about the sort of prevention-focused mindset. I think that's really an unfortunate byproduct. So let there be data. Um, we decided to conduct a content analysis of the methods blogs, and I have uh, my student, Gandalf Nicholas, to thank for this. Um, so we took the uh, blog sample, 43 that are on this blog feed. We were able to use 41 of them for various reasons. Um, they have a median life of three to four years, about a post a month. I should say the data set is potentially biased because 62% of the posts come from one blogger. If you follow these blogs, you probably know who that was. Um, 11 posts per week from that person. Um, so um, the, the uh, post level is potentially biased by that, so sometimes the analyses are on by blog level. So we, or I should say uh, Gandalf and Bai, scraped and pre-processed all this data. That took a long time. Um, and we decided to look at, at this sort of framework. I want to say that we didn't go into it with official hypotheses. I've told you what my biases are, but I have to say that Gandalf had the opposite instincts about these things, so we were kind of engaged in a, I wouldn't say adversarial collaboration, but certainly a negotiated one. And Bai was kind of neutral in the middle. Um, <clears throat> so we used uh, some of the latest content analysis um, methods. And because of our interest in uh, individual people being named, here's what we did. And this is, I'm taking responsibility for this. I contacted a bunch of people who I knew had weighed in publicly, um, 30, 38 judges, and said, who's been named in these methods blogs? Because the problem is, you can get proper names, but they might be Kruskal, right? Or Fisher, or Pearson, right? And so how do you sort that out? So I thought, let's get some human judges in here. 
they don't know what I'm doing with this, but just tell me some of the names. And there was a certain amount of consensus that gave us names to count. It's not perfect, you know, common names could be different people, but it's a first approximation. Okay, so the framework for what I'm gonna to present to you is who posts what about whom with what effect. And this is an ongoing project, so I'll be interested in feedback. Um, so, who posts? Well, there are various hypotheses you could have about gender, for example, Maybe men post more than women because men are more agentic or they're the traditional leaders in the field. Or maybe women post more because it seems like a kind of service thing to do. Or maybe both because we're getting to equity, that is equality, um, male and female in the field, so maybe there are no gender differences. Is it younger people or more established people? Well, social media are kind of a young person's thing if you look at, um, impressions, but also at the data that uh, West and Skitka presented. Or maybe it's more established people because they feel more able to have blogs. Well, the answer in our data so far is that the bloggers have traditional leadership demographics within our field. 71% of them are male, 92% are white, and 74% are mid to late career. And when you look at their uh, citation counts, they're quite established people. So, you know, the idea that this is a next-gen activity is not quite there yet. Maybe it will be, but at least my conclusion from that is that um, it's people who are in traditional leadership positions. Um, the trends about posting, um, so the green line is um, uh, the number of posts, and uh, but then that's biased by this one outlier person. Um, so the number of blogs is the red line. The number of blogs by men is the purple one, and the blue one is the one by women. So, you know, the number of blogs by women is not like closing the gap, recently at least, but who knows. So what are they posting? So one possibility is that these are methods blogs, and they're posting about methods and statistics and professional issues. Another one is the more sort of paranoid view that it's all personal attacks. Um, so what are the top words across blogs? Well, that looks pretty good. I mean, studies, effects, results, power, sizes. Okay, another better way to do it is like this. Look at that. Methods blogs are posting about statistics and replication and science communication and research findings. Imagine that. <laughs> Imagine my surprise. Uh, the names of, of people, specific people, I don't know, that might come under other content or maybe unidentified. We'll see. Um, what are the trends in, these, in the top uh, things being posted about? Well, statistics are actually kind of going down. A little surprising, but you'll see why in a minute, maybe. Possible research findings have this funny bump. Um, replication, you'll be happy to know since you're here, is going up, 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 up. And um, fraud is kind of low and flat, pretty much. So I don't know if you find it interesting or not, but. Um, given no preconceptions. Okay, um, what about who's being posted about? Um, is it rare or common to mention individuals? Um, so you just saw from the topics, they're not saying a single person's name over and over and over again, but then you don't have to. You can say the person's name at the beginning of the post and then not, but anyway, who gets mentioned? Is the paranoid view right? Is it mostly women, or is it mostly men because men are involved in posting in the first place, or is it equal opportunity? Um, I think I had an error on the previous slide, but um, so it's 16 judges, 38 names. I think I flipped it, but anyway. Um, so these are 38 names salient in the crisis debates. We had to separate out, as I mentioned, the names of researchers from the names of 
classical statistical names. Um, but we did that using um, the judges. So um, as far as we can tell, bloggers mention specific targets in about 11% of the posts. So it's not all the time, even a majority of the time. It's a minority of the time. Um, but the blogs vary a lot from mentioning nobody specifically to mentioning somebody a third of the time. What about by gender? It's men who are mentioned, much more than women. Uh, these are medians. And if, even if you take out the top uh, two most mentioned people who are Bem and Stoppel, it's still true. Um, and it depends on whether you do the rate or the sheer number, or you know, there are various ways of doing it. But no matter how you slice it, um, it men are, are way overrepresented compared to women. <laughs> Um, what goes with mentioning an individual person? Uh, replication. So as far as we can tell at this level of analysis, that's the focus of the discussion when individual people are discussed. What's the trend in this? Well, um, mentioning specific individuals is actually going up. I mean, um, and this is the rate um, per post. So how can we measure the effect? I'm not going to go out and do a clinical interview with every single person who's ever mentioned. And, um, but one thing you can do is see what the posts, if you post about an individual, what's the effect in terms of engagement of the followers or the people who are reading the blog. So posts that mention an individual target have more impact measured that way. They get more citations, more comments, and more commenters. So mentioning a specific person, I don't, don't know the valence of the reaction. I can talk about the sentiment analysis later. Um, so, um, so mentioning a person has a, an effect on how many people engage with you. Uh, other, th other things about impact, um, certain kinds of topics get more comments and citations. Uh, turns out talking about replication and research findings increases your impact. Talking about statistics has no effect. And fraud talk makes people comment less. So stop talking about fraud if you want attention. <laughs> OK. Um, and uh, in general, the rate of comments per posts and commenters per post are going up. So there's some engagement. So, you know, why am I doing this? I'm trying to bring data to bear on controversies that I personally have been involved in. Um, so what the lessons I would draw from this is if we want to improve methods, replication and findings and target talk all engage readers. I'm not recommending these necessarily for other reasons, but I'm saying that for, as far as we can tell, this is what's happening. Statistics and fraud talk do not engage readers. And we don't know the long-term impact. We don't have a good way of saying, if you read these blogs, are you influenced to change? Um, in terms of the historical record, comparing it backwards in time to previous crises, there are some familiar topics like replication and statistics and power. Um, but interestingly enough, not relevance this time. Nobody's complaining, at least in my reading, so much about relevance. Uh, in terms of the controversy that dragged me into this in the first place, um, I think the controversy is ongoing, um, as in the continuing publicity about it. Uh, in terms of protecting equity, you know, mostly it's male bloggers and mostly it's male targets. Um, it's established people, not next generation people. You can make of that what you want. Maybe it's just too dangerous a territory for younger people to be openly engaged in. Um, and that having been said, I want to thank the younger people in my lab uh, for venturing to go where nobody would dare to go otherwise. Thanks. OK, can we kick the proceedings off again, please? So just imagine I had arrived at 2.20. 
I would have said the words, welcome, welcome, welcome to our second psych debate. And it really is a great pleasure to see so many of you here today. And, and I'm really grateful for the excellent presentations we've had thus far. So what, one thing I want to say before I kind of continue my own talk is we really want you to engage. So please do use Slido, as I said before the break, and also please tweet and use the correct hashtag, which is psychdebate2. So what I want to do is um, talk a little bit about um, another side of the debate, which is the idea of a much more positive, upbeat side. So when we introduced this, uh, the first debate in 2016, one of the ideas was to have a much more upbeat and collaborative event, one where we could try and discuss the issues in uh, an engaging and friendly manner. Because at that stage, things were still very new. And one of the, the kind of main reasons we did that was because a group known as the Joint Committee for Psychology in Higher Education met in a, in a hotel in London, and we discussed this very issue. So I think it's important to acknowledge that this event is presented to you under the auspice of the Joint Committee, which involves the British Psychological Society, the Experimental Psychology Society, and the Association of of uh, heads of psychology departments in the United Kingdom. So with that um, now clear, and I get some water, I want to now start the second half of today's proceedings. So I'm going to talk to you about the idea that psychological science is a trailblazer for science more generally, or at least we're going to pose the question and try and draw a conclusion at the end. This is a reminder uh, of the Slido link and the code if you haven't been using it already. But I suppose the useful place to start our, or to continue our discussion is to go right back to 2000, 2015 and consider Brian Nozak's original paper. And as we will all know in this room, because you will all, I suspect, have read this paper. But in this key paper, I argue this was the beginning of the change. And this led to us using the terminology replication crisis. And the idea that when we tried to replicate 100 studies, only 36% of these replications were successful. And of those, the effect sizes was often much smaller than in the original study. So we used this term crisis. And as a result, lots of things have happened since. So since 2015, many different events, many different uh, key uh, changes have happened. And I think overall they're very positive, and they're very positive not just for psychology but for science. So what I wanted to do is convince you of that and, also, uh, and then also consider some of the less positive aspects. So as I said, two years ago we had a wonderful event here. We had uh, the replication and reproducitive debate number one. This is what it looked like. Lots of people smiling. I'll get you to take a photograph later when you're all upbeat and incredibly excited. And we had a great panel of individuals who were very much involved in replication. So that, to me, was, was an excellent start from the UK's point of view. But in addition, lots of incredible things have happened. We have the Centre for Open Science. It's a direct result of the excellent work that Brian Nozak and his colleagues have been doing and the, as we know, the central aim of this is to show your work, share your work, advance science. That's open science. And that's what we're all striving towards. We now have the open science framework, an incredible resource for researchers, not just in psychology. If you go and look at the, uh, the mission statement of the, the, the framework and of uh, the, 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 the open science group generally, it's about every part of science. It isn't just psychology. Look at the other things that have changed. Really brilliant innovations. Directly as a result of the replication crisis we now have, the Association of Psychological Science really embracing replication. We have registered replication reports. The very recent one by Martin Hager and colleagues on ego depletion, again, is a good example where we've tried to take a balanced look at existing effects and try and identify if they're real or not. But we've engaged in that in a very upbeat and collaborative fashion. Many journals now offer registered reports. Chris Chambers, as you know, 
And Cardiff University has been you know, a real pioneer in this area. He's done excellent work, particularly with his own journal that he's an associate editor at. Cortex is one of the first, and Chris has been pushing many other journals to do that too. Um, Chris Graff would have also mentioned earlier the British Psychological Society, we have recently launched our first registered report for the Journal of Neuropsychology. And the whole idea is that this is the, just learning the ropes with the leadership of Martin Edwards of that journal, but the plan will be to try and roll that out to all the 11 journals in time. But we felt it's better to try and embrace uh, any additional problems we might have, iron them out, and then try and extrapolate it across all of our journals. So these are excellent innovations, I would argue. We are then talking about things like this. We talk about frequentists versus Bayesians. There was a time when we didn't do such things. There is a new statistics out there. There's a new learning, and our younger, early career researchers are very much embracing these methods. But the whole idea of putting the slide up here is that we've embraced these new approaches. Although, interestingly, the Bayesians will argue with the frequentists, and we often um, still can't necessarily come to an agreed viewpoint. But the key issue is there is a new statistics out there which is going to make our science better, and that is driven, ultimately, by psychological scientists. The funding landscape has also changed. In Germany, in particular, the German uh, research councils have been incredibly influential in changing how uh, replication and transparency of research is included in how they fund their research. If you haven't seen this, it's worth uh, having a Google at it, but it's a, a really interesting document which will set challenges across Europe, but also here in the United Kingdom. But again, directly as a result of what happened in 2015 and a little bit before with Nozak and his colleagues. We have something called the Black Goat Podcast. Raise your hand if you've looked at the Black Goat, listened to the Black Goat. Some of you have. So I'm pointing in direction. This is an outstanding podcast, which is led by three very high-profile individuals in this field. We've got Sanjay Sierra Tavaza, we've got Alexa Tullet, and Samin Vazir. This is a podcast which is, in an often light-hearted manner, but also very seriously, is getting us to think differently about science, but not just psychology, all of science. So if you haven't looked at it, I urge you to um, check it out. We also have now got a new, many new scientific societies. The key one here, which is the Society for the Improvement of Psychological Science. But what's interesting to me as an observer and to others in this room, I'm sure, what is also clear is that many existing societies are considering these new ideas. So the, certainly the groups, that certainly international societies that I go to, they all often now have a stream on transparency, on replication, and on new methodology. Again, as a result of the work that has happened over the last number of years. Sorry. We have a new journal. So the Association of Psychological Science has been incredibly uh, pioneering also in engaging with the so-called replication crisis. So this is the new journal, uh, Advances in Methods and Practice in Psychological Science, edited by, by Daniel Simons. Again, one would not have imagined such a journal existing um, pre-2015. The other thing which I think is quite exciting, in a small, exciting way, I might add, is the debate that we're having about statistical significance. So on the left-hand side here, we've got a paper by Daniel Benjamin and many colleagues, some of them in, in this room today, EJ and others, who are co-authors on this notion that we should be redefining statistical significance. We should move away from P less than 0 0.05 and adopt an approach of P less than 0 0.05. But yet then, we have a really healthy and interesting disagreement which is put forward by Daniel Lakins and colleagues. And I'm putting the right-hand side here, which is justify your alpha, and I suspect some of those co-authors are also in this room today. But the idea that has been healthy, exciting, and I'm sure we will come eventually to, to a consensus. I'm just putting that up there because it's such a lovely photograph of Daniel. <laughs> but it's a really excellent 
article if you try reading it. So what Daniel had, had, had endeavored to do was he did it in a crowdsourcing way. He had a, a live Google Doc where he got lots of people to comment on their thoughts on whether or not we should, we should justify your p-value or not, and to respond to the concerns of the earlier paper by Benjamin colleagues. But again, the key point of showing this is because it was done collaboratively in an exciting way, which really is getting us to think differently about um, how we decide on what a signal is for statistical significance. But all is not rosy in the garden of replication and reproducibility. And as alluded to earlier by Susan Fisk, this article was published last week in the Boston Globe. And this is published um, by a leading uh, geneticist uh, called Pardis Sabeti. And as you can see with the headline, or the sub-editor's headline, is for better science, call off the revolutionaries. Great headline, but it sparked a huge debate. So as a result of this, article alone, we are now having a debate about the debate. Here's two key examples of this. So we have Steven Pinker posted shortly after the article was uh, published, superstar human geneticist calls for a measured approach to scientific replication. Rigor, of course, but put a lid on the aggression and call off the so social media hate mobs. Similarly, Daniel Gilbert, Again, indicating a similar response, compositional geneticist has written one of the smartest essays about the politics of social psychology, etc. As you can see, this has been retweeted and liked by many different individuals. But then, of course, in inverted commas, the revolutionaries replied. So Brian Nozak, key player in this area, obviously, then makes the point correctly, I would argue, that he disagrees with some of the characterization in those in the particular article. If you haven't read the article, it is very much worth reading. And he suggests, as you can see here in his tweet, is that, that uh, it isn't filled necessarily with lots of hostility. And he said, often the movement is positive, reflectful, or sorry, respectful, exciting, and forward-looking. Similarly, then we have or, uh, another response from Amy Cuddy. So Amy, as we will, was mentioned earlier by Susan, has also been involved in uh, a lot of the media storm in terms of replication. She also acknowledges that there's been a really positive move forward. Nonetheless, she also uses the word toxic or the words toxic bullying. So it's interesting to me, and if you followed this debate on Twitter, what was interesting to me was it was an extraordinary explosion of differences in opinion. And what it made me think of was Brexit, dare I say it. And the idea that there may actually be some sort of echo chamber out there. Because what's interesting to me as an ob a fairly independent observer is the notion that Brian Nozak and many of those excellent colleagues, EJ and others, and, and Richard and Kate, many people here are very active in talking about the methodological issues that we face as a discipline. They believe entirely in what they're saying. But I also don't doubt for a second that the individuals who have been faced with quite a lot of negative publicity, and particularly on social media, also believe that their view is real. And I can't help but think the fact that many of those individuals in both sides of this debate aren't necessarily seeing the other side's viewpoint. Because, you know, Twitter in particular is a very strong and powerful medium. It was very clear in the US election. It's also very clear in Brexit here that echo chambers and the effects of such can impact on tones of all debates. So again, it's an interesting idea just to think that both sides may be correct, um, and it'd be nice if we could meet somewhere in the middle. But nonetheless, it's worth acknowledging that very few, I would say it's a relatively small number, of real bullying actually happens. But when it happens, it's real, and it's very damaging for some individuals. And then the final couple of things I want to say is give you more examples of this blazing, or this trailblazing work that's been going on. Many of you have seen the excellent paper by Marcus Manafo and colleagues. You know, this is an outstanding piece of work. This manifesto for reproducible science. Again, it's as a result directly of what psychologists have triggered, which will impact on all of science. And as part of this, 
Marcus and, and his colleagues have identified these many different threats to reproducible science. We're aware of all these. And I'm not going to reiterate them here. But what's interesting to me is the idea that what we could also try and do is start thinking of science as a behavior. We know there's multiple levels to everything that we're trying to change. So this is a very well-known model of uh, behavior change and a framework for behavior by Susan Mickey and colleagues known as the COM-B system. And what this model it identifies that all behavior is as a result of an interaction between these three necessary conditions of capability, opportunity, and motivation. And if you buy into this model, which has been very dominant, we understand a lot about uh, the context in which a behavior happens. So if you further the idea that science is a behavior in the sense that we've got individual aspects of behavior from p-hacking right through to transparency, uh, engaging in uh, pre-registration, and also we've got the whole environment. We've got the incentive structure that exists. And if you look at any of the classic models of behavior change, you need to engage in all levels of the system. And what we should be thinking about, in my view, is we should be thinking about how we can change the incentive structure. And we should also be thinking about what the behaviors are that we're trying to change and promote. And as a result, look to these other models, like persuasion, training, enablement. And we should be moving away as much as possible from any sort of negative characterizations of people who are currently changing their ways and their methods that they're engaging in. So what I've tried to do in the last 20 minutes or so is to hopefully convince you that psychological science really has been a trailblazer over the last two years in particular, but as many other colleagues have noted, psychology and science has been changing for a period much longer than that. But we can clearly identify psychology as being central to that change. The revolutionaries, if I'm allowed to use that phrase without EJ or the others giving me a hard time about it, have done an incredible job in a difficult environment. They have improved scientific practice. They've propelled us forward in a way which should only be congratulated. But we have identified that there are some concerns that we should try and offset and change those aspects of the debate. And this is the whole idea of changing the tone when it happens, which is a relatively small tone, but it's a big tone to the individuals who are on the receiving end of it. And also we should remember that science is, and we should see it as a behavior. And we should be targeting both all levels of the system in order to ultimately lead to a long-term and effective change in what we do as psychological scientists. But the final point I would say is, it's an incredibly exciting time to be a psychologist. I would love to be an early career psychologist now. You've got this opportunity to learn all these many different methods. There's so many balls that have been thrown in the air, and you can grab some of them and run with it. And it's interesting that many of the excellent work has been done by early career individuals in terms of the methodological revolution. So I think we should all embrace it. It's an exciting time, and thank you very much for your attention. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Um, I'm waiting for the slide to come up. We have EJ, and EJ, again, one of our international uh, colleagues here. But EJ, if those of you who are here will be aware of his individual contribution to this debate and the excellent work that he's been doing. So EJ, thank you very much for finding the time to come here today. We're very much looking forward to your presentation. Since I have a, ah, here it is, awesome. Um, okay, so um, welcome everybody. Uh, my talk is about uh, radical transparency in statistical reporting. So uh, my talk has three parts. I'll first discuss what researchers want, what the field gets, and how to uncover hidden uncertainty. So. Here we go. This is, I think, the main uh, dilemma, and I think many people realize this, but it's hardly 
state it as forcefully as I'm going to state it now. So we have a researcher, Dr. X, who has a favorite theory that she has worked on and has published about previously. Dr. X then designs an experiment to test the prediction from her theory. Dr. X collects the data, a painstaking and costly process. Part of her career, and in particular those of her students, ride on the outcome. The data now need to be analyzed. If P is small than 0.05, the experiment is deemed a success. If P is bigger than 0.05, it is deemed a failure. Rightly or wrongly, this is the way things work presently. Now, who is, without a shadow of a doubt, the most biased analyst in the entire galaxy, past, present, and future? It is, of course, X. And in fact, we know this particularly in psychology, because in psychology we have studied uh, a lot of the biases that confront basically everybody. Hindsight bias, confirmation bias, motivated reasoning, you name it. In fact, if you go online and you search for cognitive fallacies, there's a poster that lists all of them. Uh, the poster is very difficult to read because there's 188 different biases on there. Uh, one of my favorite ones, which I think is also particularly important for uh, researchers, is the um, uh, bl bias blind spot. And the bias blind spot means that you think that everybody else is affected by these biases and you are not. <laughs> And this has been articulated by many people over the years. Uh, one of the more famous ones is Richard Feynman, who said, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself, and you are the easiest person to fool because of those cognitive fallacies. So we have the world's most biased analyst, Dr. X, the easiest person to fool um, to, uh, to analyze the data. And Dr. X can actually do this alone, without any oversight. In most cases, the data and the analysis code never leave the lab. So I'm going to push this theme a little a bit more. So data are analyzed with no accountability by the person who is easiest to fool, often with limited statistical training, who has every incentive imaginable to produce a p-value smaller than 0.05. And when that p-value is smaller than 0.05, the result is declared significant, and any further doubt is frowned upon. And, uh, you know, it, part of it is, is there appears to be an implicit social contract that if your result is significant at 0.05, you're not allowed to question it any longer. And I've experienced this myself when a student walked up to me and said, look, you don't believe in extrasensory perception, but we have done an experiment where people had to guess who was calling them before they picked up the phone. And people were doing better than chance. It was, of course, in an experimental setting. People were doing better than chance. P is smaller than 0.05. Don't you believe in extrasensory perception now? And I said, no, I don't. And I was accused from moving the goalposts and, uh, well. So uh, a statement by uh, the great John uh, Tukey is relevant here. He said, statistical procedures should not be used for sanctification, for the preservation of conclusions from all criticisms, for the granting of an imprimatur. But of course, this, well, uh, you may disagree with me, but I, I believe that many people use uh, statistical inference right now in order to accomplish exactly this. So researchers obviously want to discover the truth or something that approximates the truth. But they also want to present compelling data that leave little, doubt for, uh, uh, little room for doubt or dissent. They want to develop a coherent theoretical framework, and they want to publish papers that make interesting claims. And in general, people don't like uncertainty, and researchers also, they do not like uncertainty. So what are the consequences of this? Well, combined with the uh, perverse incentives that we have towards uh, publishing significant results, um, uh, the uh, allergy towards uncertainty leads to a number of uh, uh, problems. So there's publication bias, obviously. Um, 
Actually, so about publication bias, so there's this uh, brilliant story that I thought was due to Francis Bacon, where uh, somebody enters uh, the temple of Neptune, and this person is an atheist. And uh, he's being shown around, and then his friend points him to, a, to, a, um, uh, to names on the wall. There, those are all the names of the people who were in a storm at sea, and they prayed to Neptune, and they were saved. Shouldn't you believe in Neptune now? And uh, the atheist looked and said, yes, but where are all the names of the people who prayed to Neptune and drowned? Right. And so I thought it was uh, due to uh, Francis Bacon. It's actually Cicero who, who mentions this. Um, but uh, so Bacon plagiarized that a little bit. Anyway, <laughs> that's a different talk. So um, um, uh, we also have fudging and harking. And so to make this a little uh, more uh, visual, uh, our graphical artist, Victor Bakeman, uh, drew this picture. So here we have a, a researcher who's on a fishing expedition, implicitly or explicitly. Um, so when we discuss questionable research practices, there's really uh, two dimensions that we can distinguish. So um, over on the y-axis, we have different hypotheses. And so if you do your experiment and you look at the data, and from the data provide you with a particular hypothesis, um, that is a harking, hypothesizing after the results are known. So uh, Daryl Bem, for instance, uh, in his uh, uh, experiment, uh, experiments, um, also on extrasensory perception, argued that the effect was particularly strong for extrovert women confronted with erotic material. Uh, and his stimulus uh, set um, in included men, women, uh, a test of extroversion, positive, negative, uh, erotic, uh, romantic but not erotic, and neutral pictures. So uh, if you then look at your results and you, you uh, uh, start to develop a theory of why extrovert women confronted with erotic materials are particularly prone uh, to extrasensory perception, that would be harking. But there's also on the um, x-axis, there's a, a ways to massage the data. So this means you have a particular hypothesis in mind that you really want to see supported. But now there's different analysis pipelines that you, can, uh, that you can follow. And if you cherry pick the one that makes your result look, uh, you know, provides m the most favorable light for your uh, result, that's also, well, it's certainly not transparent and can be highly misleading. So that would be fudging. And this kind of fishing, whether it's harking or fudging or a combination of the two, is problematic and it's problematic both for frequentists and Bayesians. And the consequence of this is claims that are overconfident and results that are spurious, that do not replicate. So what can we do about this? Well, um, may, th there's many possible solutions, and uh, several of them have already been discussed here. Um, basically, uh, we need to be more transparent about what it is that we're doing. And when we're transparent, hopefully, um, uh, people will become uh, more honest, more forgiving for imperfections in, 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 and more forgiving for a result not being uh, as clear as one would like. So the first method is pre-registration of analysis plans. So uh, before, you do, before you analyze your data, often before you uh, collect the data, you develop a specific uh, statistical analysis plan not to, so that you are now disallowed to uh, conduct all kinds of interesting analyses, but merely to separate what you planned beforehand and what, what you did after you saw the data. And this prevents researchers from fooling themselves and others in the process. Um, the second method is outcome independent publication. And uh, the picture here is from uh, uh, by, uh, is Chris Chambers. Um, because he proposed the, um, uh, the, the registered uh, report that has already been highlighted here, where there's two phases of the uh, uh, publication process. But most importantly, if you do your research carefully and according to your initial plan that was vetted and approved, um, the result will be published independent of the outcome. A third method is a sensitivity analysis. I think this one's really important. Um, because usually when you see the, when you read an academic uh, uh, paper 
and you see a particular result, you only see a single statistical analysis. But truth of the matter is that that single statistical analysis is just one plausible analysis that you could do for that data set. Even for, the, for very simple scenarios, there's usually a whole host of analyses you could uh, consider. And in his talk, Andy already mentioned, for instance, uh, robust methods uh, of analyses, but there's many others as well. And so to uncover this hidden uncertainty about what model are you using, uh, there's different ways uh, uh, in which you can achieve this. So I'll discuss uh, multiverse analysis and, and crowdsourcing. Um, so uh, the multiverse analysis uh, was first proposed in a paper by Sarah Stegen and uh, co-authors. And um, in, in their particular um, example, what they did is they took a published study and then uh, the, the authors kindly gave them the data. And so what they did is they went over a set of decisions uh, about which data to include, uh, um, particular transformations, all kinds of uh, choices. So there's an entire decision tree of, of, of choices of what data could be in or out or transformed or whatnot. And for every possible uh, combination of choices, they calculated the same, uh, uh, th th they did the same statistical analysis. So this is still a, a very small multiverse because it only looks at exclusion, transformations, etc. It doesn't apply different statistical models that would increase that multiverse much more. So this then just shows the histograms of p-values that you get from uh, doing these different analyses. So for instance, in the uh, top graph, uh, here you see that there's an almost uniform distribution, uh, at least a very wide distribution of possible outcomes, depending on these uh, uh, criteria for uh, including and excluding uh, outliers. So that doesn't, well, that, this is the kind of uncertainty that you usually do not see in an article. Usually you see one p-value out of this distribution, and if you had to guess, where what p-value you would see, uh, it would probably be one that's smaller than 0.05, right? I was involved in an uh, interesting project um, where the, uh, there was a big data set and the question at hand was, do soccer players with darker skin tone have a higher probability of getting a red card? And um, there were, and actually Richard uh, and I did this together, I believe there were about 30 different teams of researchers who looked at, at this. And the interesting thing, first of all, is that no single there, there was no overlap at all in the statistical model that was applied. So these 30 teams looked at this question and came up with 30 different models. And these are the, uh, the uh, this is a visualization of the outcome. So you see that at the, there is a lot of consistency, but there's also some variability here. So if you take the results from the top left, and I believe that's actually the anal uh, one of the analyses in the top left that shows no effect is actually the one that Richard and I did, so that's the correct one. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, uh, but then a lot of those analyses actually show small but, but uh, positive effect. And a positive effect in this case is a, is a negative effect, right? So it's, it's uh, discrimination. Could be discrimination. So the uh, fourth method is uh, very simple. Uh, simply share the data. This facilitates reanalysis and uh, allows reviewers to propose and carry out informative uh, uh, alternative analyses. And um, so again, I have to bring up Richard and the, the pro initiative that I, that I signed. So when you sign the pro initiative, it basically means that you expect the author of a, of a, um, a manuscript to make available the data and the, and the underlying analysis code. Um, I, I often forget that, oh yeah, and if the author does not want to do this, then you're saying I'm not going to spend my time giving you an in-depth review. Now, uh, I always forget that I signed uh, that, that pro initiative, um, but I can tell you as an action editor, um, I, I do encourage authors to make their data available and their code available, and I've only had very positive experiences here where reviewers actually go through the trouble of doing an entirely new analysis 
that is much more sophisticated and state of the art, which obviously really profits the, uh, the authors. Uh, plot the data is also an uh, important uh, uh, bit of advice. Here you see the famous Anscombe's Quartet. So Anscombe's Quartet shows four panels and uh, um, the, the, the outcome of a, of, of a correlation. And only in the top left panel does that correlation make any sense. In the uh, other panels, something else is going on. And the only way to discover that something else is going on is to actually visualize the data. So whenever I see a, a correlation without a scatter plot, as a reviewer, I always ask for the scatter plot. Right? And the one time, well, I always ask for it, and sometimes I actually get it. And the one time I did get it, it was uh, the, the bo bottom right case. Right? <laughs> and I said, that's perfectly fine. You can present this. I have no trouble with it. I think data should be presented. But uh, you should present scatter plot and not just the, uh, the outcome of the, uh, not just the number R. OK, so the uh, final uh, bit of advice is to ad adopt an inclusive inferential approach. So when we look at a classical analysis, you may, for instance, see that uh, R, the correlation coefficient, uh, is 0.58. P is smaller than 0.05. And I don't think that stimulates statistical curiosity. I actually think that that, that is meant to suppress it. Like P is smaller than 0.05. Now, now you, you can stop criticizing my result. You have to trust it because P is smaller than 0.05. So uh, I'm going to uh, elaborate on this point slightly. Uh, I have no clue how I'm doing on time, so you just have to drag me off here at some point, right? Well, I'll just take Richard's time. It's no, it's no problem. <laughs> OK. So uh, consider this paper. It was published. It says this year. That's, uh, that's not correct. It was 2017 in the Lancet. Relation between resting amygdala activity and cardiovascular events, a longitudinal and cohort study. And as methodologists uh, behoove, I'm going to focus on, the, focus on the weakest link in this otherwise very interesting article. And the weakest link, uh, but also perhaps the most interesting uh, experiment uh, that they report is here. So there are 13 uh, uh, patients here with PTSD. And on the x-axis is a perceived stress scale, and on the y-axis is the activity in their amygdala. So the idea is the higher, the more active the amygdala, the higher the reported stress. And if you look carefully, you see here we have that correlation of 0.56 and a p-value of 0.049. So... Um, this is then uh, declared a success, significant, we can reject the null hypothesis. So here we are going to do a different analysis, a Bayesian analysis, uh, really quick because I have only a few minutes. Uh, we're going to do it with JASP, of course. If you don't know what JASP is, it's uh, SPSS done right. Um, <laughs> and it's, uh, it offers uh, not just classical analyses, but also, also uh, uh, their Bayesian echoes. It's, uh, uh, it uses a lot of the methodology that Richard has developed in his uh, base vector R package. Um, and it's free, of course. So jaspstats.org. So with a few clicks, you get this graph. And I, unfortunately, I cannot give you a, uh, a workshop on Bayesian inference in two minutes. But uh, what uh, you will see from, hopefully, from this solid line, which is the posterior distribution so our uncertainty after we have seen the data for the correlation coefficient, you see that there's large uncertainty about the true value of the correlation coefficient. And you see from the pizza plot above that the base factor is 2. I haven't told you what a base factor is. But if it's, um, if it's 2, it means that the data are twice as likely to occur under the alternative hypothesis than under the null hypothesis. And that's not really compelling here, right? So that's what the pizza plot is for. So pretend that that, uh, that pizza plot, the red part is pepperoni and the white part is mozzarella. Imagine poking your finger blindly onto the pizza and it comes back covered in mozzarella. How surprised are you? But well, not very surprised, right? I don't think you'll be surprised enough to say we can reject the null hypothesis. Now, this is an analysis with one particular uh, uh, model for the alternative hypothesis, but with one click in the program, 
you can explore a whole range of different models, and that range is indicated on the x-axis. And you can see that regardless of how you choose um, your, um, your alternative hypothesis, um, that evidence, the base factor, uh, remains not compelling. Right? So there, regardless of how, what you do with your alternative hypothesis, the, there, the mozzarella won't go away. Even though you prefer your pizza, pepperoni, no mozzarella, it's impossible. So, uh, to conclude, we need a lot more transparency. And I, um, I would like to compare it to mental hygiene. So the scientific equivalent of brushing your teeth or washing your hands after visiting the restroom. Um, and if you uh, tell children that they should do this, they don't like to do it. Uh, I have a, a young son and he definitely does not want to brush his teeth. Um, but it needs to happen anyway. And uh, perhaps it's easier to tell researchers how to change their culture than it is to teach young children how to brush their teeth, but I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> but journals and funders can start demanding mental hygiene. And mental hygiene can also be rewarded. For instance, journals could prefer papers that conduct multiverse analyses, etc. And once this starts to happen, very quickly it bec will become the norm and people will look back at the old days and wonder, was there ever a period where we didn't brush our teeth and where we didn't wash our hands after going to the restroom? Uh, and another thing that journals uh, uh, could do is uh, uh, publish reviewers' reports when these contain useful reanalyses, uh, promoting a crowdsourcing approach and rewarding reviewers for their efforts. And I, I put this one in because I saw so much positive effect of what these reviewers were doing with these papers. And I think I would like to see a lot, uh, a lot more of that. And perhaps this is a way in which we can uh, reward reviewers for, uh, for doing the hard work. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, EJ, for another very stimulating presentation. So we move on now to our penultimate talk um, of the day, and we move to Richard Morey. And Richard is going to speak to us about a different title that he initially, well, I'd suggest that he might want to think about. And I'm going to give uh, Richard the prize for the best title. <laughs> and so no pressure, Richard, because I'm assuming the talk will be equally as good. So Richard Morey from Cardiff University. All right, so I'm going to talk uh, about something a little different. I thought it would be a bit of a black sheep topic here, but it turns out not to be. And I think you'll see uh, that there are lots of connections between uh, what I'm going to talk about and, and the previous talk. So um, I'm going to take a lot of the things that have been said by the replication movement and the people in it, um, and I'm going to reflect that back on people in the uh, replication movement. And um, I'm going to name some names, but this is all peer in the peer-reviewed literature. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, these, are, um, these have all been peer-reviewed. So um, let's talk about the replication crisis. I don't really know if we're in a, a crisis. It's called that. Um, maybe this is part of normal science. I'm not sure. But I do know that there are some pretty deep problems with psychological methods. Um, and this could be part of the natural evolution of our science. Um, but I think um, we, you know, we talked about these over the course of the, uh, the last few hours, questionable research practices, publication bias, um, oversold and underexamined results, badly thought out analyses, lack of transparency. All of these things exist, and they exist in spite of, and I want to emphasize this, good faith participation in science. Um, this also applies to uh, the, the people in the replication movement that I'm going to talk about. Um, this is all part of uh, good faith uh, science. So there's been a lot of talk about incentives and in science. So this is from, uh, from NOSIC et al. 2012. The incentives are for surprising innovative uh, results as strong in science. Science thrives by challenging prevailing assumptions and generating novel ideas and evidence that push the field in new directions. We must make incentives for getting it right competitive with the incentives for getting it published. 
right? And the problem is if the incentives that we have are, uh, are not truth and efficacy, then science becomes a sort of game that we play with one another. And this is, this is the critical issue. Um, as academics, we really love to argue about stuff. And um, if, uh, if we become disconnected from truth and efficacy, then we end up arguing uh, over nothing and playing games. So let's talk about the replication movement. Um, now, this is something that's not often said, but the, uh, the, the methodologists and replicators, people in the replication movement, had exactly the same incentives as everybody else. Science is highly competitive, and it turns out that revealing problems in published research is, uh, is sexy um, and counterintuitive. So we have exactly the same sort of pressures that we have on researchers, except now they happen to be um, for the methodologists and replicators. Um, it turns out that many scientists don't understand statistics and this, uh, this cuts both ways. So um, researchers, um, they, uh, they may uh, uh, use bad analyses in, in their work, but also they may not be able to answer the critiques of more statistically savvy uh, people in the replication movement. And due to sort of literature isolation, um, that is that psychologists and statisticians and philosophers um, don't tend to monitor one another's, uh, one another's literatures, what you can get is statistical content that gets published in, psycho in the psychological literature. And it takes a lot of time for there to be proper vetting of those uh, statistical methods. So in this case, what do we expect will happen uh, with our replication movement? Well, you might expect that uh, there's going to be um, some poorly thought out uh, ways of attacking uh, research because that's, uh, that's what uh, you expect to happen, right? Um, we have the same incentives for methodologists and replicators. Um, so I'm going to talk about a specific case uh, where I think we have a, uh, a bad method that was used in this way. Um, now, uh, I'm, I'm going to try to be very general about it, and I, this is a, uh, the problem that I'm going to uh, I'm gonna show you is general. It's not just for the method I'm going to talk about. Um, it, it also applies to other meta-analytic method, methods, but uh, I'm going to talk about a specific meta-analytic method that's used to critique research uh, in psychology. So let me ask a question here. Um, I have a set of uh, eight flips. Um, the first eight of them are, uh, are heads. The last one is tails. And if I ask the question, um, are these coin flips biased? Your, your, your first uh, reaction is probably they seem to be. But um, that's a bit of a trick question. Because these coin flips can't be biased. We have to talk about bias in terms of the process that led to them. So if I ask you then, um, what about the process that led to these uh, heads and tails? Um, is that biased? Um, but the way that this, this question has been framed um, has been, are there too few tails? Now, uh, the analogy here is between heads and tails and significant and non-significant uh, uh, findings. Um, so uh, with that in mind, think about these coin flips. We're going to make some assumptions about these coin flips. We're going to assume that these coin flips are independent. Uh, we're going to assume that each has a 0.5 probability of success. And we're going to assume that we uh, pre-planned n flips, right? however many we see, in this case, 8. And it, the, uh, you can do this very easily. It turns out that the probability of one or fewer tails out of uh, n equals 8 is uh, p equals uh, 0.035. So there seems to be something suspicious here. Um, but we've made some assumptions here in order to get to those numbers. So let me show you actually what happened. Um, this is 100 uh, flips. And what I did was I looked at, um, I looked at the ones that had 8. Now, normally, this wouldn't be a problem because the number of, uh, 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 the number of coin flips that you do doesn't, doesn't really matter if you've set ahead of time the number of flips that you're going to do. That would be suspicious. 
Um, but if you look at what I've done here, you can see that every one of these patterns, uh, every one of these sets of coin flips has the same pattern. They're all heads and then a tail. Because what I did wasn't set the number of coin flips ahead of time. What I did was, I'm going to flip until I get a tail. There's nothing wrong with that. I just had a different process for flipping the coins. And so when I asked the question, um, are there too few tails? Now the answer is different. So if I assume that coin flips, the coin flips are independent, and I assume that each coin flip has a 0.5 probability of success, and uh, we're going to flip until we fail, that is, we get a tail. Now, what's the probability of one or fewer tails? Well, I have just as many tails as I should have because every pattern has one tail at the end. Now my p-value is, uh, is one, and there's nothing unusual about that. Um, so the point I want to make is that the coin flipping process is important. You, if you don't know the process, you can't actually evaluate whether that uh, pattern is strange. Overall, if we look back at this, overall half of these uh, coin flips turned up heads and half of them tails. That's exactly right. Everything is fine here. The problem was when I looked at that one and said that that was strange and made some assumptions that weren't true about it. Um, so the, the, the process distributes them unequally. Um, if I choose only to look at the large sequences, I'm going to be fooled about what happened. I have to look at everything um, because the groupings matter. And uh, now we're going to talk about science. Science is all about the groupings of studies, right? We're looking for, for structure in our experiments. So the groupings are everything. Um, so let's talk about the test for excess significance. Um, so the question here is whether there are too few non-significant studies in a set. Um, so these are the assumptions, the basic assumptions underlying it. We're going to assume that n experiments are independent from one another, and so these n experiments are typically from a paper, right? Um, but if you think more generally about meta-analytic techniques, these are often collected by the, uh, the, one, the, by the skeptic, um, and they're put in a set uh, post hoc. Um, so you estimate, the, the next thing you do is you estimate the probability of success post hoc using a sort of power estimate, um, but none of what I'm going to say uh, depends on that, um, but it's just analogous to the coin flip, except we estimate that probability. Um, and then we're going to assume that the researcher pre-planned N experiments. Now, I don't know about you, but I've done a bit of science, and I know that that's not the way experiments typically work. Um, now, if you're doing a registered report or something, you can pre-plan experiments, but the scientific process is quite a bit more ad hoc than that, and there's nothing wrong with uh, that being the case. Um, to take a set of N experiments in the literature and assume that they were pre-planned, uh, that's just a silly assumption. Um, but this is, uh, uh, this is the assumption of uh, Ioannidis and Tricolos, uh, Tricolinos and, uh, and Francis, who I'm really critiquing here. Uh, Francis, 2013. So what happened was, um, by 2012, uh, Francis had applied this to eight papers. There was more on the way. Um, and uh, he had said that these, the, the results in these papers should be ignored. We should just ignore them on the basis of applying this test. The logical interpretation of a biased set of findings, that is one that triggers his test, is that they do not provide proper evidence one way or another. So he was actually taking papers and saying, you know, just ignore those on the basis of this test. Um, now, in 2012, there was a special issue of the Journal of Math Psych, and statisticians were invited to comment. And this happened after um, there were uh, eight papers that, ha that he had critiqued this way. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to provide you some quotes from the, uh, the peer-reviewed commentary on the paper that, that, uh, 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 that talked about this test uh, by Francis in, uh, in 2013. This was my response. I said, the central assumption that studies can be thought of as coming from a fixed size group is violated. The assumption does not resemble actual scientific practice. 
Common violations of this assumption, such as sequential experimentation, are neither uh, publication bias nor are they problematic. Um, this test was supposed to pick up pro uh, uh, publication bias, but it, it, it's not good for that. Because the consistency test, which is what uh, he was calling it then, is questionable at best and completely misleading at worst, we should instead focus on changes in scientific culture to reduce publication bias. Uh, Van de Kerkova, uh, Guan, and uh, Stierkula said this, without prior knowledge of the true effect size, the consistency, the consistency test is unable to detect highly biased reports its lack of statistical power combined with a propensity for flagging slightly biased, that is perhaps not even problematic, slightly biased rather than heavily biased reports renders the consistency test all but useless as a tool in meta-analysis. Simonson um, said this, we, we mostly agreed. Um, he said, what are we learning from these critiques of, uh, of these, these other authors in the literature of scientific work? Uh, we're not learning that, the, uh, that publication bias happens. We already knew that. We're not learning that the critique studies ought to be ignored because that doesn't logically follow from them containing publication bias. We're not learning that the critique studies have more severe publication bias than others because, uh, because Francis's selective reporting of results and non-representative selection of studies to analyze in the first place prevents us from making such an inference. What then do we learn? That's rhetorical, just to make that clear, um, <laughs> if it wasn't. Uh, Johnson um, said this. Johnson, uh, Val Johnson is a statistician, um, uh, uh, in case you don't know the name. Um, I have concerns regarding the statistical methodology that he employs, as well as concerns regarding his guilt in committing sins of the very type he hopes to expose. Aside from the fact that the operating characteristics of the test are so poor, even more serious problems are encountered when one attempts to apply this methodology. In many cases, it's not clear which analysis and test statistics should be selected to test for uh, an excess of significant findings. This goes back to the problem of constructing this test, or this, this set on which you're going to perform the test. So what happened? How could an unvetted method be used so many times against uh, scientific work in the field. Um, well, that, that, so that's my question of interest. And I think it's, uh, there's really three uh, reasons here. Um, we have a lack of uh, qualified uh, reviewers in sight. We have uh, 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 skepticism towards the attacked results. And this is likely uh, to be, um, I think, justified in a lot of cases. We should have skepticism. Um, but uh, uh, the problem is we don't have enough skepticism about the methods that we're using to, uh, to, attack, uh, to attack science. Um, and this was actually, so I quoted this, this was actually said to me by um, someone in the replication movement when uh, we were discussing this particular method. They said, okay, well, maybe it's flawed, maybe you're right, but you know, it raises awareness of a problem. And as soon as you slip into that sort of thinking, you're playing the game. You're no longer in it for truth, you're playing the game. Um, and we really have to uh, uh, be careful about this as methodologists. Um, it's, it's not just about awareness of, uh, of some particular problem. We're, we are uh, critiquing uh, individuals' uh, science here, and we, we need to do it in a justified way, right? Um, so this, is re this attitude is really concerning to me. So uh, I think you should be skeptical of basically all meta-analytic forensic methods. This includes um, the test for excess significance. It uh, includes uh, funnel plots. It includes um, p-curving, which I'm working on a paper about now. Um, they're often poorly vetted uh, by statisticians and philosophers. Um, they make untenable assumptions about the scientific process. Uh, can you really define a trans-experimental process? How do those experiments uh, 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 fit together. And so we could end up in a situation where, where these methods wag the dog. That is, we're working to form our science so that they don't trigger these methods 
rather than doing good science. Um, and they rely on um, hidden theoretical assumptions. Uh, do studies have a well-defined grouping? Well, the way that we group studies is actually dependent on our theoretical viewpoint. And so that meta-analysis that you're going to put together uh, is, is sensitive to that. And for skeptics to claim that their set is the one that makes sense, well, there's, 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 uh, the, you, you can't verify that, right? Unless you actually knew what the underlying process was that you're trying to study, which you don't, which is, that's why we're studying it. Um, you know, what inference should we draw when something is uh, triggered here? Is it something about the set of studies? Is it something about the population? Is it something about the process that led to those studies? It's really not clear. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's a tremendous amount of confusion about statistical uh, issues in general in the replication movement. There's confusion about core statistical issues like power. There's, an, oh, uh, there's too much trust in simulation, and I think this is really dangerous because science is not a random process. It, you, can't, uh, you can't fit it into a simulation. You can learn some things from simulation, right? But, but when you go out and you attack uh, science with a, a simulation as your tool, you're going to be fooled. Um, and I think we have a lack of critique of these sort of methods. There's a confirmation bias that exists in the replication movement about these. And even if you think that right now it's OK because there's a lot of bad science out there and these methods are just sort of exposing it, um, just wait until these methods are turned. Uh, when, when we clean all this up and they're turned against good science, we're going, we're going to regret that. Um, progress will suffer. So we really need good vetting of these sort of methods. And there are, just, there are only difficult solutions uh, to the replication crisis. Um, you know, there's nothing easy. Uh, we have to vet these forensic techniques in proportion to their potential impact. Um, you know, if we're gonna, uh, if we're gonna have very careful vetting of, uh, of empirical work, we need to do the same with these methods. Um, we need to solve the biasing process. These methods aren't helpful. Uh, we need to actually go to the root of the problem. We need to, a better understanding of the necessity of negative results and methodological transparency, so echoing what, what EJ said. And we need to slow down science. We need rigorous multi-lab exploration of phenomena. We need to stop these sort of one-off, uh, very oversold uh, uh, sets of experiments that we see that we know are problematic. Um, we need more confirmatory work. And we need to eliminate the incentives for, uh, for, for game playing. Uh, I think these are the only ways out of the replication crisis. And we need to stop relying on uh, poorly vetted meta-analytic techniques to root out what is replicable and what isn't. And that's all I have. Thank you, Richard. Uh, and I'm pleased to say your title and talk lived up to the, what I was hoping, so that was excellent. Um, and I think Richard raises some really interesting issues there. And it's nice for the notion that we're reflecting back on the developments that we've been doing over the last number of years. So it gives me great pleasure, before we take the group photograph, I'm keeping you excited for that, um, or warm, whichever way we look at it. So our final presentation um, today is from Kate Button. And Kate, as you will soon find out, has also been very instrumental in uh, trying to change um, how we do our science, but particularly coming up with concrete solutions on how we can achieve this, particularly dealing with undergraduates and, and working in collaborative methods. So um, our final talk, uh, Kate Button. Okay, so I'm aware that I'm uh, uh, the last speaker in between uh, us and the, and the panel. Um, but I'm going to start with a conceptualization of, of my kind of idea of the, the wider research problem. We've heard about this lots already today. But essentially, we have a, a publication bias where we have a preference for publishing certain types of results, so maybe positive results rather than null results. We have a publish or perish culture, which as an early career researcher still on probation before I get tenure, I'm very acutely aware of at the moment, um, where our careers are often determined by the number of publications that we have and the impact factor journals that they are in. 
Um, and that might drive the desperate researcher who is keen to pay their mortgage and keep their job into a, adopting certain practices that may enhance the probability of finding significant results, but perhaps at the cost of the reliability of those results. And we've heard about some of these already, low statistical power, poor control for bias, and questionable research practices. And all of this creates a climate, or a kind of a toxic environment perhaps, where we get to the situation where people like Johnny and Edies might have suggested that most of our published research findings may indeed be false. Um, so in 2013, we looked at estimating the uh, prevalence or, or the median statistical power in the field of neuroscience using some of these meta-analytic techniques that, that Richard was just talking about. Um, but we used a very generic search term, neuroscience with the tag meta-analysis. And we just wanted to do something very simple just to see how, how much power do studies with the sample sizes that they're using have to define um, the best estimates we have of effect sizes from a corresponding meta-analysis. And we estimated median power to be about 21%. And we know that low power increases the risk of various types of inferential error. So it increases the probability of a type, type 2 error, but they're less likely to make it into the published literature, perhaps. But it also increases the, the probability that a statistically significant finding is what we would call a true positive. Um, um, and we also know that small studies yield imprecise effect estimates. So we tend to get more bias in the effects that we're estimating. And when we add the selection filter of publication in, in to, to play, then it means that it, we tend to get over estimates that are biased in a positive direction and more likely to make it into the literature. We've also heard previously about um, Simmons et al.'s famous paper, where if we adopt several um, analyses paths in an afternoon, and this could be you know, a couple of hours' work, sat at your computer, we can get to a situation where very quickly we've got about a 60% chance of finding a, a false positive finding, perhaps. So we know that it's very easy to interrogate our data, and it's very easy to generate um, positive findings, whether they're reliable or not is, uh, is another matter. So how does this all relate to student projects? Um, well, we can kind of think about the, the student project world as being the problem magnified. Each year, we have undergraduates in, in our respective departments running a series of, of research projects. We might have 100 of them, for example, um, and they're running these multiple projects that are often poorly, poorly resourced. So they have very limited time to run these research projects in. They have very limited money sometimes, um, and you might have limited accent, uh, access to, to populations of interest. Um, historically, the assessment criteria have often focused on individual contributions and creativity and novelty, although I'm pleased to say that I think this is changing. This leads for the potential for multiple studies, which are small, potentially underpowered, and have the potential for poor design. Um, they may be more likely to be testing novel hypotheses rather than replication, and then there may also be the potential for undisclosed flexibility in the way that students are analysing um, these data and, and lack of transparency, perhaps, in the way they might wish to report them. So I'd like to kind of use an example that we gave in our 2013 paper that I've adapted slightly for the, the undergraduate uh, dissertation um, setting. So I'd like you to imagine that we have 90% of student projects are testing hypothesis where the null hypothesis is in fact true. Um, we set the significant level to the 5% alpha that we usually use, and we have the average statistical power of these undergraduate projects set at 20%. If we do 100 undergraduate projects, and this might be kind of the norm for, for many university or psychology departments, then we would expect 100 true associations to exist, and of those, the studies would have with 20% power will have on average be able to detect about two of them because of the 20% power. Of the remaining 90 non-associations, we're going to falsely declare about 5% of them as significant, so about four to five. Now I'd like you to imagine that, that those students that were lucky enough to find a statistically significant finding are encouraged to go on and write those up for, for publication. Two thirds of those will actually be false positive findings. So I think we might be sending the wrong message to our students very early on in, in their potential careers, where we're rewarding luckiness or the, ch or the um, ability to find chance findings, perhaps over, over rigorous methods. 
because now I'm sitting on the other side of the um, divide and I'm a lecturer and I'm, I'm interviewing potential postgraduate students, we know that undergraduate degree class, whether you have a master's and whether it's a distinction, but also whether you've managed to have an undergraduate publication um, is really key in the way that we dis determine who goes on to study within our universities. And we know that we're working in a competitive environment and it's becoming increasingly so. So if, so if we look at this figure here, we have along the, um, the bottom number of years and the orange line is the number of faculty positions, cumulative year on year. And the blue line is the number of PhDs awarded, um, cumulative PhDs awarded. And we can see that over kind of recent years, there's been a massive increase in the number of PhDs that we're, we're producing, um, but the faculty positions are, are remaining relatively constant. Um, so it's getting harder and harder for us to, to get tenure or permanent positions within this sort of environment. And what predicts the probability of us making it as successful PIs or academics? Well, this was some really interesting work done in 2014 uh, by Van Dyck and colleagues where they looked at 20,000 um, authors on PubMed and they looked at what predicted academic success. So the red lines are those um, that go on and stay in academia and become PIs and the blue line are uh, authors that will leave academia. And unsurprisingly, the two biggest predictors of, of whether you'll make it in academia are the number of first author publications and then the impact factor of the journals that those publications are um, published within. And if you're interested about issues about women in science, whether you're male also is pretty high up there too, but that's a whole other talk. Um, so is that a problem? If we're rewarding people with high impact publications, is an impact factor a really good indicator of whether those are high quality studies or not? Well, probably not. Um, I've got the figure at the bottom here is a, is a, a nice bubble plot by Marcus Manafi um, where we have impact factor of the journal along the, the bottom and then we have the degree of bias in the effect estimate on, on the y-axis um, and the size of the bubble denotes the size of the sample from which the estimate was drawn and, and what we can see here is we have a nice correlation um, with impact factor and degree of bias with some of these studies with very small sample sizes and a huge degree of overestimation of effect size getting rewarded by publication in some of the highest impact factor journals. So we can think about the wider reproducibility problem as a current system that rewards positive findings and novelty over rigorous methods and replication and that a lack of scientific rigour in the way that we do things means that we are more likely to be able to find those positive results, but at the cost of them perhaps being more likely to be false positive. Um, what we really need is to align training and incentives for career progression with scientific rigour, not results. So in 2013, we made some recommendations for researchers um, where we suggested that some ways to tackle this, and, and this was based on best practices from across other scientific disciplines, um, was performing a priori power calculations. You know, you can find that in any basic psychology textbook. This isn't, this isn't new, this just perhaps we forgot to do it for a while. Um, Pre-registering study protocols and analysis plans. We've already heard about the open science framework and registered reports, um, but this has been, you know, this... This was based on work that had been going on in the world of clinical trials for some time. And then thinking about how we can work collaboratively to increase power and replicate findings where we're working in areas where on our own we will be unable to get sufficient sample sizes to meaningfully answer the questions we're interested in. And this has really been pioneering, um, this has really been revolutionary in the field of human genetic epidemiology, where they're really making great strides now in terms of uh, genetic consortia and so on, and it's completely revolutionised people's understanding of the uh, genetic architecture. We more recently published our manifesto um, for reproducible science, which has already been mentioned, and in that we made proposals for the need to improve methodological training. And I suggest this can really start at the grassroots at the undergraduate level. Because by training our undergraduates to do this, we're also going to be, by de facto, training ourselves into these processes as well. We think about collaborative and team science and promoting study pre-registration, and all of this can help us improve the quality of our reporting. So, in 2016, uh, we published a um, commentary in The Psychologist called Instilling Scientific Rigour in the Grassroots, 
feasibility of a novel multi-centre methodology for undergraduate psychology projects. And the idea was that we could um, kind of embed or use some of these methods that we've been thinking about for use in our wider research into how we can train, improve the training of our undergraduate students. So we can improve the quality of research training in open science and hopefully improve the quality of the research outputs, both current, so in, in terms of the student dissertations and any potential publications, but also by, by training these students so when they go off, if they do decide to embark on a career in research, we've already embedded some of the, the key principles of open science in them and they can take that forward with them and hopefully inform others of the process as well. So this was the structure of the first undergraduate consortium that we run. So this was a collaboration between the GW4 universities. Um, and it, the three universities out of the GW4 that took part were uh, myself at the University of Bath, Christopher Chambers, who we've already heard about today from the University of Cardiff, um, and Natalia Lawrence at the University of Exeter. And we each of us had a number of students. So there were eight undergraduate students in total. Um, and we decided to all work together on this one project, the effects of training response inhibition on self-reported liking of unhealthy foods. And it was a replication study, but it was also thinking um, and investigating moderators of a previously found training response. So I just added this slide in earlier today since this talk is um, at the BPS. And a couple of, I think it was a year and a half ago now, I spoke at the undergraduate education committee meeting in uh, I think it was in Birmingham, um, and at that point, it was still in the guidelines, uh, the accreditation guidelines, that it was very much focused on individual contribution to, to student um, empirical projects. Um, but I'm delighted to say that in the revised 2017 version, we now have this um, statement at the bottom, that students may undertake their empirical projects as part of a project or laboratory group, provided they are still required to demonstrate the above skills individually. So the whole thing I've been grappling with with this uh, uh, initiative is thinking about how can we satisfy the, the need for individual assessment at the same time as promoting and training and delivering reproducible open science. Um, and one of the ways of doing this, this, well the way we've approached it so far, and I'm pretty sure there'll be many others and I'm looking forward to seeing how others take this idea forward and adapt it and improve it and so on. Um, but really the core idea is that it takes a lot longer to do re reliable, reproducible research because each stage requires more thinking, more careful planning and so on. And actually trying to cram that all into an individual student project in their final year is very challenging. So what we did was we, we researchers spent from January to September the previous year thinking about um, a main research question and an overarching study protocol. So this was a bare bones protocol that we developed. We then gave that to the respective students over the summer and said to them, OK, take this protocol away and think about what additional hypotheses you would like to add to this protocol and, and tell me which measures you would need to include and design a data analysis plan to test your individual hypothesis. Um, they then, we then had the first consortium meeting in October um, where the whole consortium met together and we, uh, the students individually presented their, uh, their proposed hypothesis, the measure that they proposed to add into the, um, uh, the kind of research proposal. Um, and as a team, they then collectively decided which of those to include in, in the final study. Um, we then registered that protocol on the Open Science Framework. Data collection commenced. And then the students were provided with the data um, at the point of uh, when they needed to start writing up their dissertation. Um, and because each of them had contributed their own idea to the project, it meant that we were able to meet the, um, the BPS uh, requirements of, of being able to assess students within an individual site individually. So each of their dissertation takes a slightly different form to the other student because they've got a mini question within the overarching project, but they're still co contributing to an overarching um, whole, as it were. And then in April, um, we have a consortium meeting for the results. So again, the students then prepared a, a mini presentation on their own study hypothesis, um, but then were also able to contribute to the discussion about the overarching conclusions from, for, for the main study. Um, and that way, at each stage in the protocol write-up and the um, consortium meeting too, they're able to contribute meaningfully so that they can uh, meet the criteria for authorship of any research outputs. So 
trying to think about how we can align this need for individual um, assessment with trying to do rigorous science, um, the first approach we took was a replication and extension. So Christopher and, and Natalia have previously published a, a study looking at the training response um, training response inhibition to food and whether that's associated with weight loss. And we thought about um, whether we could uh, replicate that finding um, and then thinking about how we could extend it in terms of the students could think how that training effect could be moderated by other variables. Um, so we performed a sample size calculation based on the treatment effect from that original paper. Um, and we needed 106 individuals for that. And then each student contributed their own moderator hypotheses. Um, so that's kind of secondary analyses. Um, so that upped our sample size to 412, which you can tell that's a rookie error, error from a very new lecturer. It's very ambitious for an undergraduate project. So by the time they finished data collection, we'd actually only reached 238, which is large enough for the um, replication analysis but was insufficient for the, the moderator analyses. Um, so we've decided to continue data collection beyond the student projects. And we'll obviously uh, adjust for the uh, interim analyses we have now conducted as part of their dissertation. Um, but we're going to continue collecting data until we reach our sample size of 412 before we write this up for publication. Um, the students collectively wrote the, the protocol. Uh, uh, and they each contributed their own a priori statistical analysis plan for their individual hypothesis uh, within that study. And that's been published on the open science framework, and the DOI is there. Um, and because each student contributed to that, they qualify for authorship, and that's also something they can now add to their CVs as a, as a CV point um, for when they go for future jobs and so on. And by having this uh, pre-registration, students were able to follow the statistical plan that they set out in, in that protocol, um, which actually made their write-up easier. So they did a lot of thinking at the front, and it was quite hard work, and I think at the time they felt like they were at a bit of a disadvantage to their contemporaries because they were all going ahead collecting data, whereas our guys are still struggling to kind of uh, get the protocol ready for, um, for registration on the OSF. But when it came to the end of the project, they'd already written their methods and their, um, their introduction in their methods, and they'd already drafted their results section because they already knew exactly how they expected their results section to look. So it was just a case of running the analyses, which isn't trivial, but running the analyses and then um, interpreting and, con and drawing their conclusions. So it's actually quite an efficient way of doing it, but it doesn't always feel, feel that way at the, at the beginning when you're struggling to get your study set up. Um, we're also intending to publish our final data sets on, on uh, either a university repositories or on the open science framework, and where possible making study materials um, available on the open science framework as well. So to conclude, there are solutions to the problem of reproducibility, and I actually think I agree with uh, Daryl, this is a very exciting time to be a researcher in psychology. I think we're making great strides, and, it, 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 and there's lots of changes happening across the board which are very exciting. But we have to be mindful that rigorous research does take more time and it does take more resources. So perhaps we need to think a bit creatively about how we can work together to, to pool resources to address some of these issues. But also systemic change is really happening. Funders, publishers, researchers, you know, they're all moving in this direction. So really we need to ensure that we're preparing our students for the future of open science because it is coming, if not already here. So consortium studies offer a way to tackle these issues. Students participate in and train in rigorous methods from the start, and the idea is that we can start instilling best practice in the grassroots to try and change scientific culture from the ground up. So I have some acknowledgements of the, these are the three consortium that we're running at the moment. Well, the two of them are in our second year of the GW4 one, um, and I know we've got questions right at the end, so I'll um, finish there. Thank you very much. So um, can I invite each of our panellists up to these very fine chairs, and then um, we're going to spend about 20 minutes. We're running about 10 or 12 minutes behind schedule, but we've got plenty of time. The wine reception will continue until uh, half seven. So this, at the last event, was a very useful and enjoyable aspect. And what we're going to do is both take questions from the audience um, and or from Slido. Okay. So. 
I'm going to just kick off, but before I move to Slido, I wouldn't mind just seeing if anyone in the audience has got a burning question to ask. Everyone want to kick one off before we move to Slido? Given you're real people and you exist in the room? Yes. There's one here. Ella, have you got? Thank you. Um, my question's to Kate. I think that's a brilliant idea, and it's something that we've been kind of grappling with within our own labs and across multi-labs. And I basically just had a question about how you then go about publishing that. So one of the questions I had was that if you've got a power analysis that says you need, say, 200, and your student can only collect 100 in the time, they need to analyse that data, write it up for their dissertation, and then you collect more data to then publish it. Would you have to control for data peaking in the fact that you've already checked what they've got and you know you're going to continue that data collection? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and it has been a, and I think this is this speaks to the point of you know us revolutionaries having all these ideals, but actually it's very hard doing this sort of stuff in practice because you're trying to align several not always compatible processes. Um, so the students did have to, we had to stop data collection so that they could do their dissertations. But I would say that the advantage of, of what we've done so far is that there would be no way that we could have then um, individually published those student projects because our uh, protocol is, is pre-registered. So we made the decision, um, and in fact, I was of the opinion that we should write up what we got at that point and move on, but actually um, others were keen to, to carry on data collection because we've put so much effort into it and why not finish the study. Um, but we will be controlling for, we'll have to adjust our alpha. Okay. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. EJ. N no problem for Bayesians, of course, this, <laughs> at all. <laughs> and in fact, the, the next, the, the one we're running at the moment this year is now Bayesian, <laughs> so we're fine. <laughs> 2018. <laughs> okay, I'm going to move. Just one, just kind of one question. I'll come back to the audience. But there's a there's a the hottest question on the the Slido list. I think is directed at Andy initially, at least. Um, so it says, is an independent analyst uh, really independent if they're involved in study design and will be an author? Don't they have vested interest in publishable results? Andy. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I was kind of hoping for a little bit more. <laughs> um, I don't know. I guess speaking from personal experience, no. Because I don't ever feel, when I'm dealing with someone else's data, I don't ever feel any kind of attachment to what's going on beyond. Like, I really enjoy sitting in a room on my own with numbers. <laughs> but beyond that, I don't care. Okay. Okay. But I'm in, I guess, the privileged position where my head of school doesn't like me anyway. <laughs> and so it doesn't matter if I don't publish a lot. Can I remind you that this has been recorded <laughs> for YouTube? Uh, but nonetheless, we'll accept. Uh, that, that reminder would have been really helpful like Indeed. two minutes ago. Stop. <laughs> Susan, you want to come in? Go for it. Um, I have a follow-up question, which is, um, do we have enough psychologically oriented statistical experts because, to go around? Because if each of us in the room should get a collaborator who's a, not just a random statistician who doesn't care about our ideas and theories, but somebody who might actually think they're reasonable. Yeah, well, that's a fantastic question. So I, uh, at a different talk a couple of weeks ago, got asked a similar question about how we would implement this, and it would involve a massive cultural shift. And there'd have to be people trained to be methodologists where that was their primary focus so they um i mean i think there's a few issues here so i don't know him personally but i'm pretty sure if daniel lark is it larkins or Lakins? larkins larkins i'm pretty sure if he was here he would make some comment about you go to see the statistician and he he or she tells you what you want to know and i think there's a massive potential communication problem so we need statisticians who have sort of psychological background so they can understand what you care about in your theory and in your hypotheses and and not just be you know a, a, num a number monkey who doesn't really understand psychology there needs to be a, a good line of communication so we're for that to work you would need people trained and have a career path and be valued as equals in the process who are methodologically trained. I mean, you're absolutely right. It, as it stands now, no, there are not enough people. Okay. Good, good point, Andy, and, and Susan. 
Well, EJ. Yeah, I'd like to add to that, that in our uh, department, um, our, our psychological methods group actually has a methodology shop for uh, oh. a faculty. Mm -hmm. So there's a faculty from the methodology unit who have uh, uh, particular hours that they're in operation and grad students and professors can make an appointment and show up and get statistical advice. Uh, so, uh, of course, if you're uh, an author and you're involved in uh, doing experiments, etc., that could be a full-time job, but giving statistical advice um, is not necessarily a full-time job. So a, a good mm -hmm. uh, uh, methodologist could handle many uh, uh, projects. I mean, it's interesting. Daniel is an example. His blog is 20% statistician or whatever it's called. It kind of speaks to that issue. I want to go back to the audience and, then, and let other panelists come in. So other people had their hands up there. There's someone over here. Yes, at the back. Um, can we go back to um, EJ's comment about this is no problem for Bayesians? Because if I'm interpreting it correctly, the replication and reproducibility is for null hypothesis significance testing alone and doesn't um, seem to address the Bayesian kind of population of researchers. Should we be having the same concerns? Should we be taking the same steps? Um, I'm doing a Bayesian analysis and I, I know that I'm not necessarily powered enough now because I've run out of time. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what Richard would say. I, I believe that of all the questionable research practices, uh, the data peaking optional stopping one is probably the only one that needn't bother a Bayesian. All, all other, uh, most other questionable research practices are about hiding particular things or cherry picking, and uh, uh, every statistical method uh, has a, any statistical method would have a problem with that. But what I like about the Bayesian approach, even when you're underpowered, Right? It could still be that you have an informative result. Right? It doesn't, on average, your outcome won't be very diagnostic, but that doesn't mean that your specific data set is not diagnostic. Right? So by adopting the Bayesian framework, you can focus on the diagnosticity of the data that you have actually obtained, not some kind of average over a hypothetical sample space of experiments that you could have, experimental outcomes that you could have gotten but didn't. Richard, do you want to comment? Yeah, so um, let me say that uh, uh, it's not entirely accurate to say that it doesn't affect Bayesians. It, it doesn't affect the Bayesian inference. Um, it, of course, uh, it will affect uh, any sort of frequentist inference that you would like to make uh, about those data. And to the extent that people in psychology um, have a variety of intuitions about what statistical evidence means, um, you might want to consider both frequentist and Bayesian uh, ways of thinking about the evidence. So um, it, uh, optional stopping may be something that you would want to uh, account for in reporting a frequentist analysis alongside uh, a Bayesian analysis. Um, yeah, so, yeah, that's what I would say about that. Okay. Anyone else in the audience wants to come in? Yeah. Someone here. Hi. Uh, it's a kind of more general question because um, you've, uh, various people have highlighted conversations taking place in a, a broader media than just within the psychological literature. So you've looked at uh, um, magazine articles and so on. Um, and so looking at it, or trying to look at it from an outside perspective, one would get the impression that looking in, that psychology is in a state of, of, of some crisis um, on, a, on account of these uh, issues. Um, given as we have some potential solutions, what are the steps that we should perhaps take on a public-facing basis to try and convince people that progress is coming? Who would like to take from the panel? I mean, I think I tried to do a pretty good job that we are doing, moving uh, forward in, in quite a number of ways, actually. Um, the others may want to comment. Susan? Um, there's a communication researcher called Kathleen Hall Jameson at the University of Pennsylvania who um, is studying the narrative about science, which she says is threatening to be science is broken, right, which fits what you're saying. But she's arguing that it should be more science's discovery 
and with discovery and confirmation and disconfirmation, and that's part of the normal process, and that what we're doing is improving the science, and that we can make a new narrative that's more constructive, and I personally think more true. Chris, would you like to come in, and particularly with more independent eyes, as it, well, independent in one way, but not in another, but yeah. Um, I don't have many much to add, um, but um, I think it's true that doing research and doing science is an uncertain business, right? I don't think anybody could disagree with that, um, but I don't think that's well understood um, outside of groups like this. So I think one of the things that we could do is to continue to uh, pro pro promote understanding of um, the lack of certainty in what it is that science is. It's a sort of a messy business. Um, so that's one thing. Um, throughout several of the presentations today, people have talked about transparency in various um, guises. And perhaps that's one of the um, steps that all of us involved in doing science and communicating it could um, take, which would be helpful. And I'm not just talking about publishing data and materials, making... Um, you know, that sort of thing available alongside journal articles or even preprints, just articles, not necessarily journal articles. I'm talking about transparency from journals um, as well. You know, how do, how do journals work, right? If people really knew um, how a journal worked, how it made its decisions, um, then that would be, a, from my point of view, a, a, a good addition of transparency. Um, practically, that means things like peer review. How does uh, making peer review transparent doesn't mean having every peer review report signed, although you could do that. But perhaps the peer review conversation through the various revisions um, throughout an article could be could be made um, transparent, and that would both reward the peer reviewers for that valuable work, whether they're methodologists or others. Uh, it would add quality um, content ar around the journal article, and it would demonstrate that transparency and that sort of trustworthiness to the to the uh, people reading the content, researchers or people looking in from outside, like you suggested. Okay, I'm just going to go back to Slido because there's um, a couple of comments. First of all, a number of people have asked whether or not the slides and the talks will be available afterwards. So yes, they will be. So on the BPS YouTube channel. Um, and or on the website linked to the event. We will have all the slides there freely downloadable. And also, Andy will be losing his job soon um, <laughs> when we place them on YouTube, uh, each of the presentations. You'll be able to go to each talk individually. So there's a broad question again, Slayer, which I'd be interested in the panel members' views, which is, um, someone has asked, how can the incentives that contribute to the crisis be changed? We've talked about some of them already. But in a nutshell, can everyone give me a very succinct, uh, I use the word succinct, <laughs> response, starting here with Susan? What can be changed? Or what's most important to change? Can I pass? Yeah. <laughs> Richard? Oh, that means me. Uh, OK. Um, so I mentioned in my talk that I think uh, the, the slow science movement and the, the less uh, uh, publication pressure um, and more uh, large-scale replications, oh, I want to say, uh, let me back off the word replication per se, more large-scale exploration of phenomena are, uh, uh, would be really important. I don't know if that's succinct. But that is succinct. Great. Thanks. Kid? Um, I think funders have a major role to play in this, and they are moving on this already, but um, I think the example set by the, by the NIHR is really wonderful, where um, for their very large-scale studies, they make it mandatory for, for their fundees to publish their results. And because that whole process is now a legal, like it's a legal contract, no research that's published by them doesn't end up meeting, um, getting published eventually. That was a bit of a convoluted way to finish that sentence, so I'll pass over. <laughs> Andy? Um, I actually thought your, your talk was pretty good at answering this. Sorry if that sounds a bit... That's lazy. Cruel, <laughs> cruel. Um, <laughs> well, it's just, you know, at, at, at the moment, a lot of the driver is at the individual level, and I yeah. kind of think it needs yeah. to go the other way. So, yeah. I mean, like Kate's saying, funding and also institutional reward mm. for collaboration rather than individual efforts. So, mm -hmm. for example, 
you know, not just singing the praises of a PI on the grant, but the team yeah. that gets the grant, those Absolutely. sorts of things. That's great, Andy, I agree. Chris, I mean, Right, concise. That's it's terrifying when someone says be concise. <laughs> and means it. Yeah, he does. Okay, so uh, rock stars and orchestras, right? Taylor Swift, rock star, kind of. Um, orchestras, the London Symphony Orchestra, pick your orchestra. Um, our way of thinking about <clears throat> research quality is for rock stars, right? There were six Nobel Prizes last year. Um, there were 821 research papers published in Nature. Um, nature has an impact factor of 40 points. I don't even know what. 40.3 digits. Don't know what they are. Right, that's for Taylor Swift, right? That's for rock stars. That's okay. But most of what research is is done by orchestras, I would argue. Do you like the metaphor there? Um, so, um, so in um, Scopus, there were 1.8 million articles, research articles published last year, compared with the 821 in Nature Research, right? 1.8 million. Um, um, there are about 17 million uh, uh, researchers and postdocs on the planet, all right? And I don't know what the normal number of sites an individual article gets, but I get, bet it's between zero and one. Right? It's a very different world for the orchestra, but that's what makes research happen. Many people, you know, playing a fiddle, um, blowing a flute, um, timpani, you know, all of that stuff. So I think we need a new thing to aspire to. Not the oh, Nobel Prize is fine. Impact factor super. Go for it. But we need something else to aspire to. And there's a gap there. I don't know what what it is that we can aspire to, but we need to aspire. Find out what that is and aspire to that. <laughs> there you go. Thanks for that, Chris. Um, yeah, I think uh, outcome independent publication and perhaps uh, Chris Chambers uh, registered report uh, format. Okay. Yes, Susan, yeah, please. So one of the things I didn't show you was people's impressions of scientists compared to other professions. Our distinctive attribute is curiosity. And so I think our reputation as being people who are driven by curiosity. You know, I could be right, I could be wrong, but let me assess it as carefully as I can. Um, and that's part of the sort of science as discovery narrative. So I... I think that's what we have to reinforce. Okay, excellent. And a couple of minutes for just some questions from the audience. Yeah, go for it. Can we just pass a mic there, please? It's here. Hi, um, this has just come up. I suppose it's uh, aimed at Kate, but also related to what Chris just said about uh, rock star versus the audience. Rock star versus the audience. Um, you said that your students uh, would all get put on the paper uh, that eventually got um, published, that could be upwards of like maybe 10, 12 students. Who gets to be first author and who gets to put that on the CV and should that even matter? I suppose Chris Chambers' book, it says it should, there should be a, another way about, around this, but who gets to be the rock star in that particular way? <laughs> So again, I think um, we look at epidemi uh, genetic epidemiology as a, a trying to trailblazer for this um, because they've had such large authorship lists. They've had to come up with um, guidelines or kind of rules or justifications for how they determine who goes where on a paper. Um, and so I think whoever takes ownership of writing the paper up, actually drafting the manuscript would be first, and then whomever kind of was um, overall leading on it. So it might be that it that project was more related to, to Christopher Chambers and, and Natalia Lawrence's work, so I'll let them fight over senior author. Um, but the students would then be listed. But I think what really helps, probably alphabetically, um, but I think what really helps with this is having author contribution statements. So making it really clear, having a very detailed author contribution statement showing exactly what each person has done to the work and also in, in the write-up of the manuscript. And that way, um, when people are... Uh, employing these students in the future, they can look at that and see exactly what their role was within that paper, um, and they can also use that as evidence during their interviews and so on. Um, but I think that's probably the way forward. But in terms of how we think about the ref process and first, last, and whatever, I think there's some work to be done about the ref process around how we value contributions to papers. Excellent. Thank you. Anybody else want to comment on that general point? No? Okay. Time for maybe one final question. Yeah. Um, so that leads me to ask, if we could get rid of competitiveness in science and persuade those who lead it 
to adopt a cooperative model of working, how much of this would go away? Very good, very good question. Who, who would like to take, that's a challenging one, so who would like to take that first? Susan? I've had a couple or three maybe um, good experiences with adversarial collaboration. It's really hard because you have to respect each other. <laughs> <laughs> but if you can assume that the other person ha really wants to know the answer, that their, their work is curiosity driven and honest, um, I feel like we moved science forward a little bit on these collaborations. Um, so, you know, it's still competitive because the person I'm working with wants to be right or more right than me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but if we trust each other um, and are open with each other about what we're doing, it seems like progress can be made. Great. Richard. Um, yeah, so I've had um, some adversarial collaboration uh, experience. Um, and I think a mix, the nice thing about that is you get a mix of, uh, of competitive and cooperative behavior within, a, uh, within the same project, right? And it turned out for this particular project that I'm thinking of, um, I was wrong. Um, and that was okay. Uh, and we ended up publishing a paper, and now I have a story to tell. Uh, but we went through multiple iterations of uh, several experiments. And we finally settled on one um, after an extended adversarial uh, collaboration. And um, it, it ended up being published. And it, it was a good paper. And it replicates, um, which is important. Um, but yeah, it was uh, the, the, the experience of an adversarial collaboration had elements of both. And I think those are both valuable in the scientific process, at least in my experience. Okay. One, anybody, one final comment on, in regards to that question? Um, my Kate. sort of comment on uh, collaboration and com competition at the moment um, can make collaboration quite hard, so we're working on a wider collaborative project. Um, and it's been really tense at times between having access to the data and, and in the spirit of collaboration because... I think the other party were worried that if they shared too much of their data and their research proposals and so on, then they might be giving away their, their research ideas, but then they also wanted to collaborate on this specific piece of work. So I think if we could take away that, that, that fear of being uh, kind of pipped to the post or having your ideas stolen, then it would actually really facilitate collaboration which sometimes is undermined by this kind of slightly tense, it's a bit like the porcupines mating thing, right? <laughs> You're collaborating, but you could also be competitors, so it's like, oh, how much do I want to give away? Um, but yeah, maybe me. <laughs> anyway, is that, is that a pretty wide... That's the image that's oh. They are the two words you will take away from today. <laughs> Porcupine mating is a thing. So on that brilliant note, uh, I think it'd be appropriate to thank our panel. So we have, a, I think, Excellent presentations all day. I hope you've enjoyed it. But before we thank the, pia the, the, the panel, I would also extend my thanks to Lisa Morris and Coulthard. Lisa, can you stand up, though you hate to do that? <laughs> Lisa made a lot of today happen, which has been fantastic, as other members of her team. Um, can we also thank Wiley? Wiley are sponsoring what you're waiting for, which is <laughs> wine. Um, so we thank Wiley for that. And also we thank the British Psychological Society, the Association of Heads of Psychology Departments, and the Experimental Psychology Society also. It is not an inexpensive endeavour hosting an afternoon at the Royal Society, so, and to make it free as well. So I hope that you will agree we've had a tremendous days of discussion. There is a legacy for this event such that all talks, slides, Slido will all be available online later. Um, and you will be able to relive the experience many, many, many times. So thank you all, and we will see you over wine very soon.